Good morning, sergeants. Please start your recordings. PC recording has started. Recording to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Hope, you may begin with your opening statement. Thank you. Once you again, welcome. good morning and welcome to the New York City Council Remote Hearing on the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. At this time, with all panelists, please turn on your videos for verification purposes. I repeat, all panelists, please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at land use testimony at council.nyc. I repeat, uh, testimony, land use testimony at council.nyc. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, Chair of the Zoning uh, the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm joined remotely today uh, by Council Members uh, Barry Gradenchek, Ayala, Rivera, Reynoso, and Borelli. Uh, today, we will hold public hearings on rezoning proposals for Acme, Gem Street, 261 Walton Avenue, 30-02 uh, Newtown Avenue, and 606 Neptune Avenue, 300 Huntington Street, and Arthur Avenue. But first we will vote on a number of items heard by the subcommittee at our April 20th meeting. We will vote to approve pre-considered LU 772 for the 86 Fleet Place text amendment relating to property in Majority Leader Cumbo's district in Brooklyn. The proposal seeks a zoning text amendment to modify the special downtown Brooklyn district uh, use regulations to facilitate the operation of community facility use at the site. Majority Leader Combo is in support of the proposal. We will also vote to approve pre-considered LU 773 and 774 for the uh, 68-19 Woodhaven Boulevard rezoning relating to property in Council Member Kozlowitz's district in Queens. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to change existing C81 to an R4 district to an R6A and R6A slash C23 districts and a related zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one and two. Council member Kozlowitz is in support of the proposal. We will vote to approve with modifications pre-considered LU 775 and 776 for the 431 Concord Avenue rezoning proposal relating to property in council member Ayala's district in the Bronx. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment to change an existing M1-2 district to an R7D district, uh, together with a related zoning text amendment to establishing mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one or option two. Our modifications will be removed, uh, our modifications will be to remove MIH option two while retaining option one. Council member Ayala is in support of the proposal as modified. Um, and I'd like to recognize uh, any of the council members uh, that have a related uh, rezoning here to uh, if they have any words. Chair, I don't see any members with uh, hands raised at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, I now call for a vote to approve LU 772, 773, and 774, and to approve with the modifications I have described, LU 775 and 776. Council, can you please call the roll? Chair Moya. I vote uh, aye and all. Council Member Reynoso. Yeah. I vote aye and all. Council Member Gordenchik. Aye. Council Member Ayala. I vote aye. Council Member Rivera. I vote aye. Council Member Borelli. I echo the sentiments of our illustrious chair and vote aye. Chair, the uh, land use vote is currently six in the affirmative, zero in the negative with no abstentions and we will keep the vote open. Okay.
Chair. <clears throat> Chair Moy, I see that we've been joined by Council Member Levin. Hi. Tell Daddy thank you for making time for us. On a, on a continuing vote of the land use we items. Know. We know. We know. Council Member Levin. Yeah. I vote aye on all. <laughs> I vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Uh, the items are approved uh, and recommended. Uh, sorry, the items are recommended for approval to the full land use committee. Great. Thank you, uh, Arthur. I now open the public hearing on LU 779 and 780 for the Acme Smoke Fish Gem Street rezoning proposal, requesting a zoning map amendment and a zoning uh, special permit relating to property in Council Member Levin's district in Brooklyn. Uh, I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. If you have not already done so, you must register online in advance, and you may do so now by visiting the Council's website. Uh, Council, if you could please call uh, the first panel for this item. Chair, sure. uh, with your permission, before we call the first panel, I'll just make the uh, general yep. procedural announcement. Sorry. Uh, members of the public were asked to testify for, uh, members of the public wishing to testify were asked to register for today's hearings. If you wish to testify and have not already registered, we ask that you please do so now by visiting the New York City Council website at www.council.nyc.gov to sign up. Members of the public may also view a live stream broadcast of this meeting at the council's website. As a technical note for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of any of the presentations shown today, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. When called to testify, individuals appearing before the subcommittee will remain muted until recognized by the chair to speak. Applicant teams will be called first Members of the public will be recognized uh, as panels, subsequent panels in groups of up to four names at a time. When the chair recognizes you, your microphone will then be unmuted. Please take a moment to check your device and con confirm that your microphone is on before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony to submit instead of appearing here before the subcommittee, you may email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members with questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. The raise hand button should appear either at the bottom of your participant panel or the bottom of your primary viewing window. Council members with questions will be announced in order as they raise their hands and recognized by Chair Moya uh, in order to, be, to speak. Witnesses are requested to remain in the meeting until excused by the chair as council members may have questions. Finally, there will be pauses over the course of this meeting for various technical reasons. And we ask that you please be patient uh, as we work through any issues. And with that, Chair, uh, I will now call the first panel for the first item. The first panel will include a Ray Levin, Land Use Council for the applicant, Stu Little for the uh, developer, Adam Caslow for Agni Fish, the owner, and Ashley Thompson. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Sorry, I, I, are you all waiting for me to speak? We're going to finish this procedural part and then I'm going to turn it oh. over to you to speak. Okay. 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 Yeah. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, just before we get started with the panel, I just want to turn it over quickly to um, Councilmember Levin for some uh, remarks. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll keep this really brief. Um, I just want to thank the applicant for coming in today. Um, uh, we've been working for a, uh, a, a long time at this point on, um, on this application. And um, this is um, largely in line with the special permit um, um, that, um, that we've established for um, uh, for um, uh, the industrial business zones. Um, in this particular instance, it's, it's a little bit different, um, but, uh, but largely in keeping with the pr same principles. Um, and um, the, the kind of uh, basic takeaway that I think is important to think about here is, um, and, and we'll hear about this in the application, is that um, it's important to keep long, standing businesses, industrial businesses in this city. And um, Acme Smoke Fish is, a, um, is a, uh, an employer that um, has been part of the city for a very long time. Um, you see their products in any grocery store uh, throughout the city and um, uh, in, in many restaurants. Um, and, uh, and I think that um, I'm glad to see that this that our land use processes are, um, are um, being able to be applied um, in a way that small businesses in the city. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Levin. Um, thank you to the panel. Um, I want to thank you. We are in receipt of your slideshow presentation for this proposal. When you are ready to present it, please say so, and it will be displayed on screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and the advancing of slides. As a technical note for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would uh, please restate your name and organization for the record, you may begin. Good morning, council members, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Adam Caslo. I'm co-CEO of Acting Smoke Fish, and we are ready to present our presentation. You can put it up on the screen, please. Okay, and I see it now. Next slide, please. Uh, Acme Smokefish was started in Brooklyn by my great grandfather, Harry Brownstein, in a, 1906. Harry was a wagon jobber, meaning he started selling fish from a horse drawn wagon, leading to the creation of one of Brooklyn's best known brands, delivering quality products to hundreds of restaurants, bagel stores, appetizing shops, retailers, and other establishments throughout the five boroughs including exporting the products for, uh, um, th throughout the world, excuse me. Um, Acme's grown substantially over the past 100 years, and now we have a number of facilities up and down the Eastern Seaboard. In fact, even as we seek approval to build a new headquarters and factory in Brooklyn, we're com completing construction on a distribution center in New Jersey and continue to, to a new manufacturing site we opened in North Carolina just a few years ago. Next slide, please. But there are obviously a number of challenges uh, with operating a manufacturing site in Brooklyn. Limited ca capacity and an outdated plant are an ongoing issue. Advances in food safety and increased costs and stretch the capabilities of our aging facility. The level of investment required to upgrade a facility is cost prohibitive. Um, Out-of-state locations offer more cost-efficient cost efficient solutions, but our family wants to keep its business in Brooklyn. Um, updating our facility to reflect modern processes cannot be done while Acme continues to operate uh, for food safety regulations. Next slide, please. Key to the success of this effort is that we will, excuse me, key to the success of this project is that we will continue to operate in our current plant even as the new facility is being con constructed. Once the four-story freestanding building is done, We'll move into it and the, 
the rest of the development can proceed. In total, we will expand by some 40% to a total of approximately 95,000 square feet. Um, we're using the most advanced systems to ensure the new building is safe, neighborhood compatible, and environmentally sustainable. Thank you for your time and consideration for this proposal. Stu Little of Rubenstein Partners will now offer additional details. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, members of the council. I'm Stu Little of Rubenstein Partners, and we are proud to be ACME's partner in this venture. Next slide, please. Building and operating a factory that meets ACME's needs is cost prohibitive. Further complicating this effort and increasing both its cost and size is the fact that ACME needs to remain in its current facility until its new factory is complete. Moving twice or stopping productions are not viable options for ACME. And to meet the operational needs and regul regulatory requirements, ACME requires a standalone facility with the ability to, to install certain elements of the building systems on its roof. Next slide, please. To address these conditions, the development site was extent, extended to the entire block with agreements now in place to relocate all existing uses to nearby locations. Next slide, please. And ACME's new four-story building will be constructed on the northwest section of the site, closest to the corner of Mesrel Avenue and Banker Street. Next slide, please. Once their relocation is complete, Demolition of the current facility will commence and then construction of the remaining component will begin. The design of the new commercial spaces minimizes impact by a couple of ways. One, incorporating materials compatible with the existing character of the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Two, creating a pleasant pedestrian experience that includes about half an acre of open space and retail shops included in, excuse me, intended to be amenities to both neighborhood residents and building tenants. Next slide, please. Third, completing the building with a glass box significantly set back from the brick facade of the base. Next slide, please. The reality is that the commercial component of this plan offers a revenue stream that is absolutely needed to subsidize Acme's new home. The cost, of the, building, the cost of building this new facility is some $40 million more than will ever be recovered, making a standalone factory for ACME economically unachievable. Next slide, please. By allowing this proposal to move forward, more than 100 union jobs at ACME, many of which are held by Brooklyn residents, will be saved and a place for more than 2,000 jobs will be created. Next slide, please. Some 500 million, some, excuse me, some $550 million in private investment will offer an economic boost that is needed now more than ever. In offering support for the project and recommending to you its approval, Community Board One, Borough President Eric Adams, and the City Planning Commission all offered suggestions on how the plan could be improved. In short, we have agreed to almost all of the suggestions that were offered, and I can walk you through them now. Next slide, please. At your suggestion, Council Member 11, we are working on an agreement with Evergreen Exchange, who is North Brooklyn's leading industrial and manufacturing advocate that will add additional assurances that the industrial space will be occupied by ACME. In the event that ACME does not occupy the space, another industrial user will. We will be submitting a copy of that letter outlining the agreement for your review. To ensure that local residents are fully able to enjoy the benefits derived from the development, as recommended by CB1, we have an agreement in place with St. Nick's Alliance, which will serve as our partner in providing skills training and job placement services for at least 20 
chair, it appears that we are having a technical issue with one of the panelists. Uh, please stand by. We try to sort through this. Thank you. Mr. Little, if you can hear me, uh, we appear to have lost you for a moment. Are you here? Hi, apologies for that. I apparently got kicked, but I am here now and ready to continue. So as I was saying, we'll be providing quality jobs for building service workers through an agreement with 32BJ and for construction workers by following the citywide industry agreement. Also, we will comply with all local laws and include several environmentally friendly best practices. And we will improve the pedestrian experience through the creation of more than half an acre of open space that will link McCarran Park to the future Inlet Bar. Excuse me, to the future Bushwick Inlet Park. Next slide, please. We also looked at recommendations to shift FAR to widen base floors, which you can see here. Next slide, please. We found that doing so would require the elimination of open space and significantly reduce energy efficiency, as demonstrated in these slides. Next slide, please. And ultimately, those proposed changes would challenge the, econo the economic viability of the development. Ray Levin, our Land Use Council, will offer details of the zoning changes we are seeking. Thanks. Thank you, Stu. Members of the subcommittee, I am Raymond Levin of the Herrick Feinstein Law Firm. Land Use Council for RP Inlet, the applicant for the actions before you today. Uh, next slide, please. This plan is based on an innovative idea that new commercial space could offset the cost of providing new manufacturing space. This concept was formalized with the enactment of the Industrial Business Incentive Area, IBIA, special permit first utilized at 25 Kent Avenue, uh, two blocks from this site. Building on that idea, the current proposed proposal betters IBIA, the IBIA special permit in two ways. Unlike the existing IBIA projects, in this project, the industrial space is built first before one square foot of office or retail space. And rather than providing generic speculative industrial space, in this case, the industrial user is known and the space is tailored to their needs. To permit this development, we are seeking to, a change in the zoning district and the grant of a special permit under the large scale general development provisions of the zoning resolution. Specifically, a zoning map amendment changing the existing M31 district to an M15 district. Uh, next slide, please. And a special permit to allow certain penetrations of the sky exposure plane and setback distances. These waivers will compensate for the limited footprint, footprint and floor plates available for the project's commercial component due to the standalone requirements of the ACME factory. Next slide, please. These waivers would allow the office building's street wall to exceed the 85 foot maximum by less than 20 feet and allow the upper two floors of the office building to penetrate the sky exposure plane by less than 20 feet on Gem Street and Meserol Avenues. These waivers would lessen the impact of the four story freestanding Acme factory building on the office building and allow the floors in the office building to be aligned with the market expectations to foster the development's financial viability. Thank you, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Next slide, please.
We're available for okay. questions. Thank you. Sorry, there was a delay in, in that. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, so when did ACME begin exploring the options for expanding um, or relocating? Um, I, I don't know whether Adam is still with us. I know he had he he had to catch a plane, um, and uh, um, they were uh, looking at this uh, for some time. I'd say at least five years. Okay, and if if you can just go into again, uh, how does the existing facility fail to meet the company's needs? It's made up of, of multiple buildings that they've purchased over time, uh, starting in the in 1950s. Um, so it's uh, it's sort of a stitched together um, facility, um, very hard to operate efficiently. Um, and also as more um, uh, FDA health requirements have come into play, uh, very expensive to try and meet those requirements uh, with uh, with this facility. So, uh, so for a lot of reasons, um, uh, it sort of time has caught up caught up with Acme. Um, and as uh, as Adam mentioned, they had uh, uh, built a, a factory in the Carolinas, which was um, uh, which complied with all those laws, was much more efficient, and they like this facility to be uh, up to that standard. Okay, and did ACME consider uh, any new locations elsewhere within Brooklyn or uh, New York City? Or has there been consideration uh, to relocate outside of the city of New York? Well, as I said, they, they, had, they have a, a plant which they, which they built um, in, in the Carolinas. Um, the, they looked at let me st take a step back. Yes, they, they, looked, at, 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 they looked at up. Uh, Ray, I'm I'm un unmuted. And, oh, and I'm sorry. Said, I, I, no, it's okay. I, I, no, it's fine. I, I we were having some technical issues, but you captivated, I'd say, the majority of, of, uh, of <laughs> the story accurately. And again, I apologize, as Ray mentioned, um, I I'm unable to be on video right right now. That's so fine. simply put, our, our, our business has thankfully grown. And um, as Ray mentioned, we've assembled kind of buildings throughout the block of Gem, Gem Street over, over time. But because it was never designed to build for its current intended use, you know, in the early 1950s, it's, it's a zigzag of sorts and it's quite inefficient. So we've been unable to fix some of those inefficiencies while still being able to operate over, over time. Additionally, the, the, the headquarters of our business is in Brooklyn. You know, all of our, our, our staff and teams have, are based in Brooklyn. And so we've just simply outgrown our, our, our current space. Um, in answer to this second question, I think was, have we looked at other options? The answer is, is is yes, um, about five years ago, we needed to expand some manufacturing space and we looked up and down the Eastern seaboard and settled it in a manufacturing space in North Carolina. Um, while it, it suited our needs, definitely it's, it's, we gave up something by not being in Brooklyn. Um, there's a premium to be in Brooklyn, not just because it's uh, a nice place to live and work, but the, the workforce in Brooklyn is second to, to, to none. Um, we, we really believe that, that the success of our company is vital to being in this community. Um, we're willing to pay a premium for it. Um, but, you know, we, we had looked at, and, and there are certain things that can be done outside and others are just best done right at home. Thanks, Adam. Um... Let me let me ask you this as well. What what factors led to Acme to decide uh, that a partnership with a commercial developer for a mixed use project was the best option uh, to stay in Brooklyn? It's a great it's a great question. Um, I think 
my my family and our, our leadership team has kind of pondered on how do we grow and expand, but we're not in the real estate business. We're in the smoke fish business. Um, we have this property that we've sat on and, and it was, it's, it's, it was just, it was kind of like, a, and I remember back when I first joined the company, um, we were such an advocate of the IBZ and wanting to make sure that no one was going to kick us out as the neighborhood was changing so rapidly. Fast forward 15 years later, you know, it, it feels that, that manufacturing and uh, residential and commercial are sort of in this coexistence in, in creating the, the allure for the community. Um, not the question, I'm sorry. It, your, your question was, I'm sorry, now I have the question again. It's all right. It's all right. I said, what factors um, led you to decide to partner up um, with a commercial right. developer on the mixed use? Right. So, so like I said, we didn't know the first thing about being in the real estate business. A mutual friend of mine who had worked with Rubenstein introduced us and basically said, Rubenstein was the first real estate professional to come to us with a plan for how to help our business. Um, it, was, it was an acne driven idea that allowed us to, to grow for the next generation um, and, and still, you know, I guess solve for the business part. Um, you know, we used to get calls from real estate people all the time about our property, but we, would, we didn't know what, where we would go if we, if we moved out of Brooklyn. So ultimately, the ideas that Rubenstein brought to the, to the table were so intriguing, and we were working on this plan for well over a year and a half before bringing it here today. Great. Thank you. Um, so with that, uh, there is an existing uh, zoning special permit. Uh, under Section 74-86 uh, uh, to facilitate the mixed industrial commercial projects and ensure that the inclusion of uh, permanent industrial space uh, and which, uh, it, which was used by a member of this development team, uh, Rubenstein Partners, to facilitate the 25 Kent building in Brooklyn. Uh, why is that special permit tool not being used uh, for this proposal? Well, that special uh, tool has uh, has was tailored to that project at 25 Kent that Rubenstein undertook and uh, and fulfilled its commitments and built the building uh, and it's there today if you want to go see it. Um, because of the uh, standalone nature of of the uh, Acme facility and the fact that the Acme facility is being built first and then the rest of the site becomes available. Uh, some of the provisions in the uh, special permit having to do with uh, height limits, having to do with certain open space requirements, um, uh, having to do with certain floor area requirements um, could not readily be been met. Uh, we've spoke to, um, uh, to the uh, city planning department about modifying that special permit. Uh, at the time they were not- um, uh, Can you- um I don't mean to cut you off, but you, you mentioned height and floor space. So can you tell yeah. me what, what the difference was? Well, the height, the height uh, is 110 feet in the, uh, in this, in the IBIA special permit, mm -hmm. uh, which can go up to uh, 135 feet if you meet certain open space requirements, uh, certain configurations. Um, our building as proposed um, is 178 feet. Um, part of that is because the factory building itself is, uh, is, un is 80 feet or so, um, and therefore you can't build across, uh, you know, the whole site. Um, uh, some of the, as was shown in our slides, some of the um, proposals by the Brooklyn Borough President in terms of, of widening out uh, the building and covering more of the site uh, as a way to bring the height down, um, that went a little bit, but in order to bring it down and meet those requirements, you basically have to have the factory 
uh, you couldn't build the factory independent and therefore, you know, Acme couldn't keep, keep, uh, uh, keep working. Um, so that uh, the floor area is, is slightly different. The floor area in the M15 is 5.0. The, the maximum floor area you could get in the IBIA is 4.8. Um, not a huge difference, but, uh, but enough. This project, as, uh, um, as Stu mentioned, uh, the economics uh, to keep the factory going uh, are difficult, and the subsidy that the office building provides um, is helpful and every square foot matters. So, uh, so that's the other um, major change. There are a whole bunch of, a whole slew of, uh, of urban design uh, um, uh, items in the uh, in the IBIA. Uh, this building was uh, was not designed with uh, with those uh, in mind. Um, and the um, and the requirements of the open space. There were um, in order to get the height uh, the, up to 135 feet. The open space had to be. Uh, a certain configuration in a certain location, as you can see in our in our proposal, we have significant uh, open space, which is going to be public open space under the uh, general large scale special permit. Um, but the configuration of it uh, and its relationship to the building is slightly different than the IBIA would require. So there were a number of things that um, uh, that we spoke to city planning about as an option for this project. Uh, at the time, they were not uh, enthusiastic about trying to um, uh, tailor uh, the general uh, IBI text to this project. Um, and, um, and so we went with the uh, M15. Um, um, as I said, I think that since we're building the factory before we build any of the commercial space, um, it's it's very different than the uh, than the IBIA model where everything gets built uh, together and you really don't know who is ultimately going to occupy uh, the industrial space in this in this situation you do know uh, and they're right here with us uh, testifying before you. Well, thank you because you answered my my follow up question to that just now. So. <laughs> We're, we're, we're slimming the questions down now. Uh, you you might've mentioned this before, and I think it, it came up in one of the slides, but since the industrial space, you were just mentioning that uh, just now, will actually not be required through uh, zoning. What guarantees are there that future development uh, will actually include the proposed space for the Acme fish? Well, I think, uh, you know, to reiterate, we're building, we're building the factory first. I mean, that's what unique about this uh, project. Um, basically, the office building, which uh, would spin off um, uh, funds to subsidize the, the, the factory uh, rental, uh, the factory gets done first. We don't even build any of the commercial. So, uh, so number one, we have a factory. We're 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 assuming Acme is going to move into that since this has been driven by them, as uh, as Adam mentioned. Um, what happens if uh, if they uh, if they either don't move in for some reason or at some point in the future uh, their lease runs out uh, the world uh, you know doesn't want smoke fish anymore um, how 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 are we sure well what we've done is we've been working with um, uh, on several fronts um, one is with uh, IDA, uh, we're in uh, discussions with them. We have been for a while. We are expecting that once, uh, once the uh, uh, council hopefully approves approves these changes, that we will enter enter into an agreement with them. Uh, they would have um, uh, the ability to monitor the use uh, of uh, of the uh, factory building. Um, so that's. Uh, uh, you know, one way. We're also uh, at the um, uh, council members uh, urging, uh, working with uh, the local industrial service provider in uh, in North Brooklyn uh, on an agreement where uh, where we would commit um, to uh, to if Acme if Acme 
doesn't move in um, and to uh, abide by um, the uh, allocations of space that are in our proposal. So 15% uh, of the space would be for uh, industrial use and 40% of the space would have certain restrictions that are that, monitor, that uh, mirror the IBIA uh, proposal. If at some point in the future, uh, since uh, we're looking to keep industrial space in this building for in, in perpetuity, uh, in the future, after the, after the facility is built, uh, we would work to, uh, to re-tenant that building. Now, obviously the building is special purpose for, uh, for ACME, it's not easily uh, uh, reused. Uh, so we would work with, uh, with the local uh, uh, service provider uh, to uh, identify um, uh, reusers, uh, but we were also committed that we would not use that the, the, with the factory building for uh, for commercial office or for uh, any uses that are other than uh, than uh, innovative uh, industrial uses in the future. So um, I think then I think that's it. Uh, Stu, uh, I'm, I mean I'm sorry. Raymond, I'm going to start cutting you off because you like starting to answer my question. Did you get a, a, a an advanced copy of my questions here? Uh, well, I, you know, I've known a couple of the ones that I had coming up. <laughs> I've kn I've known you for a few years. I don't know. Uh, uh, well, I can I can I can let Stu answer these questions because then uh, he's probably you know not on the he probably didn't ha didn't get the memo the year the memo of what your questions were. But I I I, I just. Let me just get a couple more in before I turn it over to Council Member Levin. Um, has the impact of COVID-19 on commercial development and the, and the demand for uh, office space affected the outlook for uh, this development at all? Yeah, I can take that. So, I mean, certainly it has. You know, if you step back in time a year and a half ago, you know, in addition to Inlet, we're obviously the developer, owner, manager of 25 Kent. And that's a project that you know came up online in late 2019 and we began leasing up. Um, and right pre-COVID, we had you know substantial negotiations, letters of intent, um, you know, negotiating leases on over 70% of the building. And as a result of the pandemic, a lot of those requirements got put on hold, some temporarily, and we're seeing them coming back now, and others, you know, indefinitely. There, so yes, COVID has had an impact on the risks of this project. We do see substantial comfort in the fact that, you know, what we're building first is an industrial warehouse for Acme. And it won't be until several years later after that delivers, you know, likely 2026, until we're out in the market leasing commercial space. And so while today, you know, if we were bringing online an additional 600,000 square feet of commercial space, I think that would definitely, you know, raise some red flags in terms of risks. Um, you know, we were able to look through to 2026 and, see a, a North Williamsburg that will be ripe for people looking for office space and retail space. But yes, the, the risks, um, you know, there were risks in 2019 with this project and those risks are, I would say, even more highlighted today. Okay, um, I'm gonna switch over to parking now. Um, how, how did you determine uh, to propose 150 uh, parking spaces? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, the our environmental analysis actually uh, said that we we might need more than that. Um, uh, community the community um, uh, as we've watched them uh, analyze other projects um, have had concerns about um, a lot of parking, therefore attracting. Uh, more uh, more vehicles to the neighborhood. Um, if we provided the amount that the environmental studies asked for, we would need another special permit. We'd be above 150 spaces. 
So we decided to go with 150, which were allowed without any special requirements. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we are looking towards the future. Um, as we know, the city now with, uh, with bike lanes, with, uh, with scooters, with alternate means of, uh, of transportation, we believe that the 150 will be sufficient. Um, even though the environmental using their metrics uh, comes out with slightly more. Uh, so that's how we ended up with it. Okay. Um, and I know that you kind of uh, alluded to this before because you spoke a little bit about um, uh, the borough president uh, and what they were looking at in terms of the modifications. Um, but if you could uh, it, it, tell us the modifications to the bulk in order to respond to the concerns from the neighborhood residents. Um, and how are these suggestions that were given um, by the, the neighborhood residents affect the outcome of the project? I'll let, I'll let Stu answer that. Uh, the neighborhood residents would like us to take off two or three floors from the building. Uh, that's not what the borough president's proposals were. We can talk about the borough president's proposals, which were much more modest and didn't actually reduce the height of the, the overall height of the building. But in terms of what, uh, what taking a couple floors off the building will do is really, Stu can answer. Yeah, so, you know, the borough president's suggestions, namely we're taking bulk off of the top of the building and reallocating it to the side, to the sides. And that, you know, poses a couple different issues that we discovered through the course of evaluating those proposed changes. So first, when we look at the viability of leasing space and energy efficiency, as the floor plates become wider, it is more difficult for natural light to penetrate those, you know, those floors. And that causes impacts to energy efficiency, which was one of the issues we face. Also, given the size of, you know, as you continue to widen out the floors, they become less desirable because people are looking for a natural feeling of the height of a floor to the width of the floor. And so as we continued to widen the floors, we thought that, you know, the potential marketability of that space could be at risk. Third, um, you know, the, the higher floors in these developments are more attractive to potential renters of space than the lower floors. And so by removing you know, substantial sections of the top floors and reallocating them throughout the building, um, you know, we, estimate, we estimated that in addition to the $40 million shortfall that exists on ACME, we would be contrib you know, these changes would contribute at least an additional five million dollars, um, you know, making the project economically not feasible. And then fourth, you know, and this definitely isn't scientific, but just looking at at the plans and the open floor space, um, outdoor space, you know, it it felt impeded by the changes there. It, due to the creation of some overhangs on open floor outdoor space that would otherwise exist. And so it was really the culmination of a handful of characteristics that resulted from the proposed changes that led us to you know, go back to CPC, explain to them you know, why we came out where we came out. And you know, I think the project that they proposed that you're seeing today, they agree reflects you know the best the best foot forward that we have. Okay, uh, and and this is my last question. Um, had, do you have a plan in place um, to ensure local hiring and MWBE participation during the construction phase? Yes. Yeah, so we will be. We will be applying to ICAP, which has requirements as part of that program. Um, so yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's it for me. I, I want to now uh, turn it over to Council Member Levin for uh, some questions. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Stu and Ray. I don't know if Adam's still on. Thank you, Adam. <coughs> um, uh, I mean, I'll just uh, first off say, you know, I had the opportunity, of, I, I think it's probably two years ago at this point, um, in the summer of 2019, I believe, uh, went uh, and saw the facility, you know, um, you know, put the, put the, 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 uh, sanitized boots on and and walked around um, and and was really struck at how uh, cramped it is. It's an older facility. It's um, you know the it's obviously um, highly um, sensitive space. Uh, you know because it's a, a fish manufacturer that is you know that where fish is being smoked. You have raw fish. You can't have the raw and the and the smoked or the cooked in the same space, um, and so having all of that um, uh, so close is is very. I could see why that's problematic uh, for a business to continue to grow. What what's the what's the current square footage that you have right now, Adam? Roughly sixty thousand. And the new facility would be how many? Ninety five thousand, but we get a blank canvas, so it's it's much going to be used much more efficiently. Um, we, we expect that we will be able to increase our output by more than double. And that's, that's, you know, right, right away. So that's, that's in, um, in five years time. Yeah. Uh, what's the, you have over a hundred employees. What's the average length of, um, of time that an employee at Acme's worked there? Oh my gosh. Um, put it this or if way, you don't I have it, that's it, fine. I, I, I don't have that. That's that I can give you off the, the cuff, but it's gotta be about 10 to 12 years. I mean, these old Polish ladies still wanna, wanna pinch my cheeks and I'm 38 years old. Um, and, and the, the um, the work is, I mean, you know, it's a, it is a, um, I don't want to say a specialized work, but it's, it's, it, it, the experience of, uh, is, it takes, it takes experience to, to do it well. And it's, it's a, um, uh, there's, there's been, there's professional development within the company. Absolutely. I mean, our, our production manager started out as a box maker about 30 years ago. Um, you know, what's, I, I think what's, what's uniquely special is the local workforce. Um, the people are happy to have the work as our business grows. We have opportunities for overtime, opportunities for technical skill development from food safety to, uh, you know, so we, we, we put, um, I can't remember the name of the program, but we, we put several factory employees through the management training program offered by, I believe it's Evergreen, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, and it, it's, it's, you know, the family business culture extends beyond my family, but also to the family of, of, of our workforce, the Acme family that we've referred to it internally, of people who kind of buy into, you know, and take a collective pride into what we're doing. And then what, what, uh, what kind of benefits do your employees have? Health benefits, retirement benefits? So um, our, in, in Brooklyn, our, our factory employees are members of the UFCW um, union. So they, they have full medical, um, pension, um, dental. You know, I, I, I don't have the, the full quantitative uh, package off, offhand. But the entire but, workforce is unionized, is that right? In, in Brooklyn? Factory, in Brooklyn, entire factory workforce, yes. Factory workforce, okay. okay. Um, uh, I mean, I'll just, you know, editorialize for a second. I think that it's, um, you know, Acme has been one of the um, kind of long time larger food production companies in, in North Brooklyn and, um, you know, I mean, I'll, you know, recently in the last uh, 10 years, there wasn't, there was another large um, 
uh, family owned food manufacturer, um, uh, uh, Cumberland Packing or, you know, Sweet and Low um, down by the Navy Yard that, that did in fact um, move to um, another state that had a lot more space and, um, and, and probably uh, lower, lower uh, wage standards and, and works, work safe standards. So, um, you know, I, I've seen it happen. So I, I am, you know, I think, I mean, I, I'm, we're looking at this as a land use matter. Um, it has to make land use sense. Um, that said, I do, I do appreciate, um, you know, ACME making this, this, the long-term strategic decision to stay here. Um, I mean, this is at least, I mean, just from a business perspective, if I could ask Adam, like, what's the, like, how, how many years does this commit ACME to staying in the, in the neighborhood at the, at the, on the low end? Like, like at least how many years do you, do you imagine from a, in, in your own kind of um, uh, business planning? I mean, in my mind, we're, so the, I, the terms of the lease that we're doing is 10 or 15 years? No, uh, thir 30 with extension options up to 50. So to the extent that uh, that answers, I mean, we're, we're planning on signing a 30 to 50 year lease. I think that, uh, you know, I, I imagine, I, I certainly hope that it serves as our head headquarters for the duration of that, if not more. Yeah. Um, I mean, and that's, that's meaningful, uh, obviously. Um, uh, on moving over to the, um, the broader building, um, what's the, what's the sustainability, um, environmental profile of the building? Can you speak a little bit more to that, Stu, in terms of, um, what are you, um, what standards are you, are you expecting to meet, um, uh, carbon, carbon footprint, et cetera? Yeah, so we anticipate that all of the, you know, required statutory, um, you know, requ requirements will be, will be met. We're seeking to meet mm -hmm. those. Uh, additionally, you know, we're pursuing lead certification um, and expect, you know, lead silver. Um, but you know, to the extent that questions have come up on those environmental issues, we're pursuing a, a, a best in class environmental building. Um, and that's part of how we how we market our buildings, you know, similar to how we did at 25 Kent uh, to two tenants who care about uh -huh. these things. Um Okay, I you know moving forward to maybe like a little more specificity about kind of what um, you know what are some of the attributes in terms of like is there going to be um, uh, rooftop planting or um, uh, solar or anything like you know in terms of the the um, energy consumption profile and, and things like that if 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 you could um, uh, share that with us that would be great. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get that to you. Yep, okay. we can follow up. Um, in terms of kind of the industrial component and, and, and the mechanism by which that's committed, obviously with the special permit that gets um, locked in, um, uh, w what's the mechanism that we're looking to use here? Well, we're, we're, we have IDA. I mean, the community, community board of our president uh, both encouraged uh, us to pursue IDA, which we are doing. Mm -hmm. And we assume that that will be in place. Um, that I believe extends for a minimum of 25 years. Uh, that IDA, uh, we will, will uh, indicate that it's for the industrial use. Um, uh, I know that there was a concern that somehow uh, between the time that the, um, that these uh, zoning matters are approved and the time that the factory is completed and ready for occupancy, um, that something could happen which would, uh, uh, you know, cause ACME not to, not, not to uh, go into the building. Uh, as I said, we don't think that'll happen, but if it does, we've entered into 
Uh, we're negotiating an agreement with Evergreen to monitor that situation and have indicated that at that time we would, uh, we would provide at least 15% uh, of whatever building gets built uh, to be industrial space, a la the IBIA, and also to limit the uh, uses on 40% of the space, also uh, similar to IBIA. Uh, with uh, Evergreen uh, monitoring, monitoring that. After the building is built, um, then uh, we, would, we would also commit to 15% uh, of industrial space, but basically re reoccupying that building. I mean, when, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, we're I'm not ripping down that building, you know. I'm, I'm less, I'm, I'm, frankly, I'm like less worried about after, if a building's, if the factory is built, it's a fish factory. I know about the fish. I have another. There's another fish uh, um, uh, manufacturer in the in, in the 33rd district as well. So I'm I'm familiar with kind of the you know and the the kind of limitations. I mean, just from from physical configuration, it's not right. really. Um, it's a very specific type of design and use. And um, yeah, it's not like you're going to be moving like a you know clothing manufacturer in after. Um, but, uh, or, or some other, like a tech business. Um, but uh, uh, what is the, but what's the mechanism the, the, uh, that you're proposing with Evergreen? Is that, a, is it a, uh, anything that's a, like a legally binding, is there a right of action? If it's, say for example, if, if, if Rubenstein signs this letter with a letter of intent of some kind or an MOU with, with, um, with Evergreen, what is the, and, and, you know, I'm not saying that th that they will, but what if Rubenstein decides that they don't want to honor those commitments? What right of action then does does the does Evergreen, as a party to that uh, uh, agreement, have um, for remedy? They they're they're going to monitor what happens. We're going to we're going to provide them with with uh, building plans. Uh, if those plans don't don't show don't conform with the uh, special permit, um, obviously they're they're going to point that out to the public, to you, to the council member, to the borough president. Um, we've. But what could the borough? What could the borough president or the council member do at that point? The zoning's already been conferred. Well, there's there they can certainly you know, move to rescind it. They can, uh, you know, go to the building department. They, they're, the legal, uh, the ability to stop the building permit, if that's what we're talking about for something that doesn't match the special permit, right? Mm -hmm. give, in essence, to be giving back the special permit, say we don't want to build in accordance with the special permit, right? Yeah. There's, 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 there's the public opinion and, and Rubenstein uh, his ability to pursue projects in the city going forward. Um, the enforceability of, uh, of the IBIA is uh, city planning, uh, city planning's signing on uh, as the enforcer of the restrictive declaration. Um, they are not doing that in this case. Um, the city council could uh, be an enforcer um, because they have uh, longevity. Um, Evergreen uh, is not an enforcer in that sense and uh, hasn't actually been looking to be an enforcer in that sense. Um, uh, even if they were given- What about like, a like an, a, an actual restrictive declaration recorded against the deed of the property? But who, we were talking about who would enforce it. Right, but I, it, it, Regardless of who enforces it, is that is that what's being proposed? Like an actual restrictive declaration recorded against the deed, or is it just a letter? It's a, uh, it's, a, letter? it's a it's an agreement. It's an agreement. It's not being proposed to be recorded because uh, the the uh, Evergreen's uh, participation uh, twenty years from now, uh, if Evergreen no longer exists uh, and it's recorded against the property, it creates all kinds of problems. Uh, mm -hmm. Unlike if it was city planning or the city council, things that entities that ha that go on forever. Uh, um, um, so you know, it it, it would create uh, problems in the future. 
Okay. I mean, let's, let's keep talking we about could... it. Cause I, I want to make sure that, that, um, you know, I try to keep an eye out for like, you know, the worst case scenario. Um, and since I won't be around, um, you know, and as a former council member, I don't think anyone's going to like, I, I don't think that, I don't think anyone's going to care what I have to say about it. Uh, so, you know, it's like my, my ability to, to influence public, public opinion will be uh, uh, significantly curtailed at that point. Right. So I, I want to be able to have, Yep. But and your successor, your successor would certainly I don't know um, have something to say about it. I don't know. I don't know who my successor is going to be. So that is, <laughs> let's keep talking. Let's keep talking about it. And because um, uh, I because I, there are a lot of aspects of this of this proposal that I find um, very good um, and very positive. And we just want to make sure that there's, um, you know, that we're that we're ensuring um, that, um, that worst case scenario, um, that might be legally, um, uh, available, um, is, doesn't, but, you know, doesn't actually happen. Right. And we understand that and we can continue discussions. I mean, we're talking about the, the third mechanism, you know, belt suspenders. And I think, yeah. think you know, evergreen ab agreement, we're calling it the cummerbund, um, you know, First, we're looking towards the ACME lease, then IDA, which we have been suggested suggested to move forward with, and then finally Evergreen Agreement. Um, mm -hmm. So understand, and you know, we're working with you to lock it up in as many ways possible that that give you comfort. Okay, great. All right, that that's it for me, Chair. Thank you, Council Member um, Levin. Um, Sure, by the way, you can see, as you can see, my kids only come when they know that I'm speaking. And then like, if I'm, if, if, if I'm not talking on camera, then they're like, they'll go away. So. Yeah, <laughs> no worries. Uh, uh, council, do we have any uh, other council members that uh, have questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no other members with questions. Okay, there being uh, no further questions, the panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the Acme Gem Street uh, rezoning application? Yes, Chair Moya, we have approximately six public witnesses who have signed up to speak. For members of the public here to testify, please note again that witnesses will be called groups of four. If you are a member of the public signed up to testify on the Acme Gem Street rezoning proposal, please stand by when you hear your name being called and prepare to speak when the chair recognizes you. Please also note that once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you'll be removed as a group from the meeting and the next group of speakers will be introduced. Once removed, participants may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this hearing uh, at the council website. And we will now hear from the first panel, which will include Larry Rothschild, Randy Piers, Grace Bristol, and Paul Simulski. The first speaker will be Larry Rothschild, followed by Randy Pierce. Time starts now. Just a, a quick uh, reminder uh, to the members of the public. Uh, you will be given two minutes uh, to speak, and please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms uh, has started the clock. So, uh, Randy, you may begin. Time starts now. Time starts now. Is it? Our first speaker will be Larry Rothschild. Okay. Who will be followed by Randy Pierce. Okay. Larry, whenever you're ready. Good morning. Thank you. Morning. I was on mute. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm Larry Rothschild, Director of Workforce Development at St. Nick's Alliance. Um, speaking on behalf of the Acme Redevelopment Project, um, we have, we're in the process of forming an agreement um, with RP Inlet, R Rubenstein, and uh, in, in terms of construction jobs and construction training. And so there's a real commitment to hiring locally from Community Boards 1 and 4 and, and Brooklyn from with under, un and underemployed. Um, and St. Nick's Alliance runs um, a skill build construction training program. It's a seven week training uh, that 
that delivers job readiness training, um, OSHA 30, the site safety training, flagger, scaffolding, fire guard F60. Um, and in this partnership, we would be training uh, up to 50 individuals and there's a commitment to hiring 25 on the project. Um, and so we're, we're excited for this partnership to give our, our trainees and graduates the opportunity to work locally. Um, and there's a, there's a commitment from, uh, from RP Inlet um, to also invest in these trainees and, and contribute towards the, the training that we're developing. So we're, again, we're very excited for this partnership. St. Nick's Skill Build Program has trained, over th trained in place over 350 people. Um, and we have a 90% placement rate. Um, we look for strong employer partnerships and, and we feel that this project, um, we're excited that this project keeps a long-term employer in the area and keeps jobs in the area. And we feel that this, our construction skills training, uh, this will give us an opportunity to place future graduates in a local project. Okay, thank you. Uh, for your testimony, Larry. Next, we'll hear from Larry Piers, uh, excuse me, Randy Piers, followed by Grace Bristol. Time starts now. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, members of the council. Thanks for having me. I'm Randy Piers, president and CEO of the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, a membership-based assistance organization, which represents the interests of the business community throughout the borough. The Brooklyn Alliance is our not-for-profit economic development affiliate and it works to address the needs of businesses through direct business assistance programs. This project is for the expansion of Acme Smoke Fish, a Brooklyn-based legacy manufacturer, uh, to allow them to remain in Brooklyn in a modern 95,000 square foot facility dedicated to manufacturing. The Brooklyn Chamber is pleased to support Acme's proposal at this public hear hearing, uh, and we look forward to uh, continuing on in this process and affirming our support. ACME started its operations in Brooklyn over 100 years ago and has since expanded to facilities in Massachusetts and Florida. ACME is one of the oldest continuously operating manufacturers in Brooklyn with a workforce that is almost 75% minority with 88% living in New York City and 60% within two miles of the factory. It is ACME's desire to remain and expand in Brooklyn and this new project uh, will be protecting 100 union manufacturing jobs. The project follows the model that's successfully pioneered by Rubenstein Partners at 25 Kent, which is us utilizing market rate retail and commercial uses to offset some of the investment costs of the new manufacturing space. The project will generate $550 million in much needed private investment, especially as we come out of this pandemic, increasing the tax base, which is essential uh, to stimulating economic growth borough-wide and citywide. The development is a key component in supporting continuing manufacturing uses in North Brooklyn and will generate 2000 commercial jobs, which are sorely needed as the borough seeks to recover. The team is, that is engaged uh, has been uh, outreaching to the community for over two years, uh, and the plan makes lots, a lot of sense, both for the business community uh, as well as the residential community. We are in full support of this mi mixed use manufacturing and commercial project at 10 Wythe Avenue, and we look forward to Acme's continued growth as a, as a key employer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. The next speaker will be Grace Bristol, who will be followed by Paul Samulski. Time starts now. Good morning. Uh, my name is Grace Bristol. I'll be reading testimony prepared by Jonathan Bowles, Executive Director of the Center for an Urban Future, a think tank focused on creating a more inclusive economy in New York. I'm testifying in favor of this project because New York City was facing a good jobs crisis long before the coronavirus pandemic, and this project will preserve and create many new good jobs. In the 20 years immediately before the pandemic, New York City lost 112,000 manufacturing jobs, 63% of the total manufacturing jobs that existed in 2000. During the past year, the city has lost another 10,000 manufacturing jobs. New York badly needs to hold on to the well-paying manufacturing jobs that remain, and this project does just that, preserving over 100 union manufacturing jobs. Supporting these jobs today requires embracing innovative financing mechanisms like this one. Without it, the economics just don't work. That's why in the last couple of decades, there have only been a few new industrial buildings developed in the city. As much as I love the manufacturing component of this project, the new offices will ultimately create even more opportunities for living wage jobs for lower income residents. Like it or not, where good paying jobs have been growing in the city, it's almost entirely been in the office sectors. That was certainly the case in the years before this pandemic and it's even more true today. 
But prior to the pandemic, 83% of office jobs in the city were in Manhattan. We need to grow more of these jobs in Greenpoint and other parts of the city. Doing so will lead to more jobs and internships for local residents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Grace, for your testimony. We'll now hear from Paul Samulski. Time starts now. Good morning. Thanks for this opportunity. My name is Paul Samolsky. I'm the president of the North Brooklyn Chamber. We represent the businesses within the hyper-local community of Bushwick, Greenpoint, and Williamsburg, and we fully support this project. ACME has been a great neighbor in its current location since 1954, and their company, being in business for four generations, has always shown respect, not only for their community, but also for their workforce. We definitely would hate to see them forced to relocate because their current location, from their current location due to the lack of sufficient space. That said, we also greatly support the idea of preserving manufacturing space within our community, which this project obviously does. The idea of seeing a significant amount of new jobs offers as a result of this expansion, many hopefully going to Brooklyn residents, makes this project even more of a good thing for us. We know that ACME is an equal opportunity employer and that they they're committed to creating a diverse work environment, and this also positively resonates with us, especially during these challenging times. We congratulate them as well as Rubenstein Partners, who are leading the project, on their thoughtful and creative design. We've had very good interactions with Rubenstein in the past, thanks to their 25 Kent project, and we trust that they will deliver what they promise, as they did with 25 Kent. We also have an excellent history with Evergreen, and we're pleased to see that they're being consulted on this project. And by the way, I also want to point out how disappointed the community would be if Fish Friday Outlet no longer provided the community the opportunity for the community that it currently does. We're pleased to offer our support for this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for your testimony. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for your testimony. Uh, do we have any council members that have any questions for this panel? Chair, I see no members with questions. Okay, there being uh, no questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Council the next panel you. will include John Jero Roman and Emil Freja. John Jero Roman will be the first speaker, and then Emil Freja. Time starts now. Good morning, my name is John Hyro, and I'm a member of 32BJ. I'm here today on behalf of my union to express our support for the pro proposed project with 30 Gem Street. 32BJ is the largest property services union in the country, representing 85,000 property service workers in New York City, including more than 1,500 who live in the Greenpoint Williamsburg neighborhood and 486 members who work in the community. 32BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build. I'm happy to report that the Rubenstein Partners and Acme Smoke Fish have made a credible commitment to creating prevailing wage building services jobs at this site. This commitment is an investment in the community by providing wages and benefits that give working families opportunity for upward mobility and security. We estimate that this development will lead to the creation of 18 new janitorial jobs and approximately eight security jobs. It is not often that a company like Acme Smoked Fish stays in New York City. We are so pleased that a company with deep roots in the community is able to expand and develop their facilities while providing opportunities for the community. We are in full support of this project and we have full confidence that Rubenstein and Acme Smoked Fish will be a responsible employer and presence in the community. For these reasons, we respectfully urge you to approve this rezoning. Thank you. 
Thank you, John Haido. Thank you for your uh, testimony today. The next speaker will be Emil Frazier. Time starts now. Hello, um, I'm Emil Frazier. I'm the communications manager for Evergreen, the local business service provider in North Brooklyn. I'm testifying today on behalf of Evergreen to express our enthusiastic support for the Acme Smokefish expansion. As you know, Evergreen is supportive of the, of the mixed commercial and manufacturing concept. We believe that is, it, if it's done correctly, it will result in a minimum of no net loss of manufacturing space while allowing for additional commercial development. We are glad to have an innovative proposal that will allow Acme Smokefish to expand in its longtime home in the Greenpoint Williamsburg IBZ. And we appreciate the creative approach that Acme Smokefish and Rubenstein partners have undertaken in developing the commercial manufacturing mixed use development. We are excited to see it come to fruition and hope that the model will, own, will be both successful and replicable. Acme, smoke, Acme Smokes Fish local expansion is constrained by the existing condition of its real estate holdings and zoning regulations. In recent, recent years, um, Acme has chosen to expand its operations outside of its longtime home in Brooklyn. This mixed use project will allow them to create a significant manufacturing expansion on the side of they have occupied for almost 70 years. This expansion will allow Acme to increase the number of production and administrative jobs on site. A significant amount of Acme's current projected and future workforce is located, is local, sorry, meaning that their expansion will have a direct economic impact on the local community. Finally, the uh, insignificant investment in the facility will allow Acme to grow in place in a state of the art production facility purposely built for their needs, ensuring that the proposed expansion will provide high quality employment opportunities for years to come. Well, we are gratified to see. Acme, uh, stay on site and- Time expired. Yeah. It's okay, you, you wanna wrap it up, Emil? I'll give you a couple of seconds. Um, no, yeah, we support this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Chair Moya, that was the last speaker for this panel. Yeah, I see no members with questions at this time. Okay. Um, okay. So there being no members of the public who wish to testify on uh, LU's number 779 and 780 for the Acme Smoked Fish Gem Street rezoning proposal, the public hearing is now closed. And the Chair. item. Oh, I'm sorry. Chair Moya, excuse me. Sorry. Uh, with your permission, we'll just. Uh, do one last check in to make sure that no one else has signed up. If there are any members of the public who yet wish to testify on the Acme Gem Street rezoning proposal under LU 779 and 780, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will stand at ease while we check for any newly registered members of the public. Okay, Chair Moy, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify uh, on LU numbers 779 and 780 for the Acme Smoke Fish Gem Street rezoning proposal, the public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. Uh, I now want to open the public hearing on LU 781 and 782 for the uh, 
261 Walton Avenue rezoning proposal seeking a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment relating to property in Council Member Ayala's district in the Bronx. Once again, if you wish to testify in this uh, meeting, please visit the Council's website now to complete the online registration process, or you may submit written testimony to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, before anything, I, I just want to check to see if um, Council Member Ayala um, would like to say a few words before we get started. Not seeing Councilor Ayala with the hand raised at the moment, Chair. Okay. Uh, so, Council, if you could uh, please call the first panel for this item. The first panel for this item will include Nora Martins, Land Use Council uh, for the applicant, Joshua Weissman and William Bollinger uh, as a developer, and John Wolfling as the project architect. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Okay, then council, if you could um, please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have received your presentation for this proposal. When you are ready for it to be shown, please say so and it will be displayed on screen by our staff. Uh, slides will be advanced uh, when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and the advancing of slides. As a reminder for everyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panel, if the panelists would uh, please restate your names and organizations for the record, you may begin. Good morning, Nora Martins from Ackerman LLP, Land Use Council for the applicant. Hi, good morning. I'm Joshua Weissman, president of JCal Development, um, the developer. Good morning, William Bollinger, also with JCal Development, developer. Good morning. This is John Wolfling from Dadner Architects, applicant or architect. Okay. okay, I think we're ready to proceed with our presentation now. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning again, Chair Moya, council members. Thanks for having us here today. Um, this application seeks a uh, zoning map amendment, zoning text amendment uh, for a site located at 261 Walton. Avenue in Community Board 1 in the Bronx. Um, you can see here on the slide the, the general location, but we'll go into the much more detail there next. In order to facilitate the proposed development, which will be a 100% affordable housing building uh, with ground floor uh, retail, um, well, commercial likely retail use, um, seek two land use actions. Seek Made approval of two land use actions, including a zoning map amendment to change the existing special mixed use district, which is a MX 13 pairing an M14 and R6A zoning district, seeking to change that to an R8A with a C24 zoning overlay. Uh, the site, the zoning district boundaries are coterminous with the site's boundaries, uh, which is just north of East 138th Street um, between Walton and Gerard Avenues. In connection with the zoning, MAP amendment also seeking a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area to establish the project area's MIH area option one. Next. You can see here on the zoning change map uh, to the left, uh, the image to the left shows the current zoning, which uh, the site is entirely included within an M4R 6A zoning district, um, which does permit as of right residential and commercial development. Um, however, the density that's permitted under the R6A is not sufficient to support affordable housing development. So we're seeking to rezone to an R8A with a C24 overlay, which will permit uh, essentially the same uses, uh, but with a greater residential density. 
The R8A is the equivalent to what's permitted in the C6 two-way zoning district that's located directly across Walton Avenue. Next. This slide shows the current site conditions and the location. You can see outlined in yellow the uh, existing site, which is occupied by a former self-storage facility, uh, was fell victim to a fire several years ago and uh, has remained boarded up and unoccupied since that time. So the proposed development would replace that uh, former self-storage facility. Um, on the next slide, you'll see John Wolfling from Denner will, ex will explain, but you can see this area here while very low rise and manufacturing right now is actually undergoing significant um, evolution as a neighborhood. There are several developments currently under construction, uh, residential developments, and also just planned in the pipeline for the next several years. I'll turn it over to John now. Next. Thank you, Nora. Um, so as Nora mentioned, this is a site that is um, undergoing a, a significant transformation. Uh, these buildings that we are showing here in orange are uh, either uh, in construction or have uh, been built or are planned, and it is, it's just tremendous. Uh, I think it is a, it's a neighborhood that has uh, such rich transit that it is, it's, it's appropriate to have this type of uh, density uh, in the neighborhood. Um, but you can see our project at 261 Walton in yellow um, is, uh, you know, it's, it's part of this redevelopment and this density increase, but uh, is actually small in comparison to many of the buildings that are uh, either planned or are being built right now. Uh, the, a, a lot of these buildings are uh, either mixed income or, um, uh, or market rate. Um, some of them are affordable, uh, but the, I think the majority of the units that are going to go in here are, uh, are market rate. And I think uh, our all affordable project will fit in very nicely uh, and help this neighborhood. Next, please. So the building that we are, we've we have designed and have uh, uh, conceptualized here is primarily uh, residential. It's 12 stories. We are actually maxing out uh, on the floor area before we uh, reach the maximum building height, which is actually 14 stories for the R8A district in the uh, with the MIH program. Uh, but as you can see, it's primarily residential, 162,000 uh, square feet. Uh, within that, we're going to be able to provide 190 units of uh, affordable homes, uh, and 48 of them are going to be permanently affordable through the MIH Option 1 program. And we are actually able to, to provide some parking. The site has some uh, unique topography, which is going to allow us to tuck some parking in uh, along the Girard Avenue side. Uh, we've done some uh, 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 extensive geotechnical investigations of the site. We've determined where there's rock, uh, how difficult it's going to be to, re to remove some of that rock. So we think that uh, a significant portion of the, uh, of the Girard portion of the site can actually service as parking or maybe um, a service area for the commercial uses that are intended for the ground floor. Uh, we do plan on having uh, two ground floor spaces that will front on Walton There'll be a total of about 19,000 square feet. They are gonna be split up into two separate spaces because the site, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, has, has this significant topography. So it would be really difficult to have it be one consolidated space, but we think that the, uh, the configuration that we have will actually work quite well for the neighborhood. Next, please. So this is uh, the aerial rendering. Uh, you've seen this in the initial slide, but we are, uh, we've, the design that we've come up with is a, a mixture of bricks. Uh, it's it's going to be primarily a brick building. Uh, we've created a, a darker base, a cohesive base that ties the whole, uh, the whole site together. Uh, and the 12 the story tower that is above that, that's the residential is going to be uh, in two different brick colors and there'll be some recesses and changes in the, in the street wall to help diminish the, uh, the mass of the building. We're also grouping windows together to to bring the, uh, the, the facade a, a scale that I think is appropriate to the neighborhood. Um, and there's even a, an outdoor roof terrace that's uh, you can kind of see in that inside corner um, of the building where the gray and the, uh, the light gray and the darker gray masses meet on the second floor. That's gonna be a great amenity for the, uh, for the residents of the building. Next, please. Oh, back one, please. 
Yeah, thank you. So this is a, a street level rendering of uh, Walton Avenue. Um, the, the neighborhood is very different right now, but we really believe that with all the development that's gonna be happening in the neighborhood and, and our development that's gonna happen here, uh, this will, it, the, the street will actually really be activated. Uh, our intention at the ground floor is to have a lot of glazing, a uh, great uh, degree of openness so that you know, light not only spills out <coughs> at night onto the sidewalk, um, but it really activates the street. Um, this is, you start to get a sense here of how the, the upward slope works. Uh, this is looking northward along Walton Avenue. Uh, and there's about, I think it's a 12 foot grade difference between the south end and the north end of, the, uh, of this, this frontage. Next, please. So this is the Girard Avenue uh, facade. Uh, one of the comments that we got as we've been going through this and, and meeting with other um, organizations, and, and uh, I think this is actually a, uh, uh, a uh, city planning comment, was what are we going to be doing along uh, Girard Avenue to activate that facade? And we, um, we do have glazing and residential windows that are above that, um, above the, the base of the building, but we are looking to uh, work with a local artist, uh, um, to do some sort of installation along this facade. We are gonna have street trees that'll, that'll um, uh, be located along this facade, but you can see at the, the left-hand side where that parking entrance uh, might be. But we also have above that, uh, the, the, the kind of second floor of this base is a series of windows that would be at the, the retail spaces uh, that come in from Walton and have uh, visibility out onto, onto Girard Avenue and provide some eyes uh, on the street uh, in that portion of the site. And I think it's uh, Josh is next, if you can go to the next slide. Yeah. Josh is muted. There you go. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, I was muted. Um, good afternoon, good morning. Thank you for your time. I'm Joshua Weissman, president of JCAL Development. On this slide, you'll see we are a Bronx-based uh, real estate development and construction company. Our office is down on Bruckner Boulevard in the South Bronx, Mott Haven area. And on this slide, you'll see some of our other um, affordable housing projects that we've completed. 950 Summit Avenue was located in the High Bridge section of the Bronx. It's a 58 unit ELA um, program building, and it was completed back in 2016. Um, we just recently, about a year ago, completed 2395 Frederick Douglass Boulevard, which is between 128th and 129th Street. And that was a full rezoning with a fresh program bonus. We took an existing one story um, Bravo supermarket and we rezoned it and we built 75 um, Ella affordable housing units and put in a beautiful new 7,500 square foot supermarket, which we'll see in some slides in our presentation. We've also developed down here in the Bronx on Alexander Avenue in the uh, Mott Haven area, uh, some walk up market rate buildings with ground floor commercial which I'll speak about too on our next slide. So next slide, please. Um, regarding the 261 Walton Avenue project, we believe that this project will generate about 200 construction jobs and approximately 25 uh, permanent jobs. That would be within the building staff as well as the um, retail employees. We've been in the Bronx for over 20 years and primarily have done our work in the Bronx and we've established a large Rolodex of all Bronx based suppliers as well as subcontractors. Um, so we believe it benefits both our jobs and also the community to try to keep our um, suppliers and subcontractors local. People don't have to go over bridges to get to us and they're usually a quick commute to our job site. Um, for local hiring, we have an MWBE um, track record. An HPD project, we will have a 25% requirement, which on our last two buildings, we hit that target you know, uh, very easily due to our 
knowledge and our history here in the Bronx. And that would be the same for this project as well. We actually already reached out to a local not-for-profit called Sobro down here. And we had a Zoom conference with about 75 MWBE subcontractors with them. And we're constantly adding to our um, contact list um, MWBE and, and new and local um, subs and suppliers. So that was a really good Zoom that we had with them. We also, as the contractor, will hire um, you know, a labor force who works under our payroll. And what we do there is we typically have a sign-in sheet at our construction trailer, and we have people who can sign up, and we work with them to make sure they get the proper training, OSHA cards. Now it's 60 hours, and we try to hire as well from within the community. Next slide, please. So as um, John mentioned, the Walton Avenue project will have about 19,000 square feet of retail on the ground floor. Um, we do have an experience with retail on Alexander Avenue. We actually signed our stores to young local entrepreneurs. We have the Lip Bar, a woman named Noel Santos. It is the only bookstore in the Bronx, believe it or not. And she just celebrated her two year anniversary. She's an absolute rock star and has made it through the pandemic um, and she's doing really well. We have a bistro, which is a hip hop themed restaurant. Um, they also have done an incredible job throughout the pandemic. They supplied um, lunches and dinners to first responders throughout the Bronx. They remain open and they actually just celebrating now with the spring. They have a beautiful outdoor area and they're back open doing full um, lunch and dinner for the public. Um, as I mentioned before, we have a supermarket tenant at Frederick Douglass Boulevard, and um, I will show that to you in the next slide as well. Next slide. So this is the supermarket that just opened at Frederick Douglass Boulevard. It is a fresh program. It's about 7,500 square feet, huge produce section, fish section, meat section, deli over there to the left, um, all LED lights, high ceilings, really modern, efficient, and well-stocked. Um, next slide, please. And I will now turn this over to my partner, Bill, to go over the unit sizes and AMI levels. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you all. Hopefully you can hear me. Oh, okay. Um, so what you're looking at right now is a proposed unit distribution that um, was created after many iterations working with the, the council member, working with the community board, um, and, and, and working with the borough president's office. Um, you'll notice that we have 40% uh, uh, of the units are actually two and three bedrooms, even though the HPD um, ELLA program only requires 30% combination. Um, that was very important um, locally to make sure that we hit those marks and we did. Um, right now, this current distribution um, meets the, the ELLA term sheet, which, which we actually, that's kind of our target. We, we prefer that as opposed to like mix and match or um, square uh, projects. So this, this we find is a better um, solution in, into the neighborhood. Like Josh said, we've been here close to something me 30 years actually in the neighborhood. Um, so. Uh, these targets are 50% of the units will be at 50% area median income and below, and the balance will be at, at uh, middle income, uh, you know, making sure that we're providing opportunities for um, young people who have gone to school, you know, you want to live in the neighborhood and need um, options at those higher income bands, as well as, you know, for, you know, your, your typical, um, you know, school teacher, you know, fire, fire, and things of that nature um, to make sure that we're being inclusive as possible. Um, so, I mean, I can go in more detail, but these are basically the incomes um, as of today based on the um, AMI distributions. That's it. Thank you. And then as to marketing, one of the things that we um, uh, really strive is, is making sure that not only do we hit the um, 50% preference that is required as part of the lottery process from HP to HDC, but that we exceed it to the extent possible. And it is like a true lottery. The more people that we have locally that apply, the more likely we are of exceeding 
um, the 50% requirement once once we've hit it. So we we have no issue going out. We 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 meet with um, local not for profits if they want to have host something. We drop off the uh, flyers once it's gone um, live as far as the advertisements um, to make sure that everyone's aware of it. Um, and uh, and so we we try as hard as we can to make sure that we reach as many people within within the community board and the surrounding community boards as possible um, to to not just hit that fifty percent but stay beyond it. And then we also HDC has also been a good partner. Um, they will bring their uh, people to to the local community um, to discuss how you apply under since most of it now is online and it can be a little a bit intimidating for um, some folks going online to use the system, yeah. even though you can use the old school um, applications as well. And one of the other things that we do is we typically put a sign up on the site ahead of time because we get lots of inquiries. It's amazing how many times people will ask, you know, like when are you in apartments, that they can then contact us and we'll, we'll, we'll put them on a list that we can um, remind them when, when it's going to the open market. And I, I think that's it. Yeah, that concludes our presentation. I just want to add one thing quickly, which is just that um, Community Board 1 uh, didn't issue a formal recommendation, but they did at their full hold a hearing and at their full board meeting approve the application um, by a vote of 15 to 3. Just wanted to make that. And now, happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much. Um, just a couple of questions here. Um, over the course of planning for this project, the number of anticipated units um, had decreased from 206 to uh, 190. Can you speak to why that is? Yeah, um, Josh or Bill, I can take that if you want me to. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, as uh, was mentioned uh, in the presentation, the, the mix uh, actually changed. Uh, we increased the number of uh, larger size units um, to the to the what you saw on the chart. So we uh, and you know there's only floor area only goes so far. As you increase the number of larger units, the unit count is going to go down. Uh, so that was really the 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 mechanism or the the result of that changed mix. Would, and would that be due because you said the larger units, but would that be due to the increase in the three bedrooms? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you also indicated plans to develop the site uh, under the HPD Ellis program. Can you provide a sense of where this project stands in the pre-development process? And uh, also like, when do you expect uh, to close on HPD financing? Um, well, we, we, are, we, we are in their queue. Um, I'll say that. Um, uh, and look, everyone knows right now the HPD's queues are, are can be quite lengthy um, and long, but we, we are in their queue. Um, they do like the project quite a bit. Um, the, the, the Bronx planner, Ted Weinstein has, um, you know, he's, he's, he was very, very, you know, informative about the community board, um, you know, telling them you have all these like thousands and thousands of market rate units coming on. Um, there's obviously in this neighborhood, a lot of concern about, as, as in most New York City neighborhoods, but a lot of concern about, you know, gentrification issues and, and those type of pressures. So, um, you know, we've got a lot of positive feedback from HPD um, and, and we'd like to think that, you know, as soon as uh, slots open up, um, that, that we would be <clears throat> you know, able to, to, to move up into the, into, into the slots. Obviously there's a lot of stimulus dollars coming out. Um, hopefully that would be helpful, but we're told in general, if you come to a new project with HPD, you're looking at about a two year, a 24 month um, closing window. But one of the things that we do in our projects are we like to get going with the, the pre-development as much as possible. And the, the, the more you're ready to go, the quicker you move up in line. So, um, you know, we would like to be, if we could close in two years, that would be, that would be great. If we can close in a year and a half, that'd be even better. Okay, so let's stick with that. So when do you expect to secure all the agency approvals needed uh, to, the be to begin the construction uh, on this development? You have a, a sense of when that is gonna be? We could be ready with DOB um, in a year, but I think the, the bigger hang up is, uh, is the pipeline and getting, the, uh, getting to the closing. Okay, but, and how long do you expect uh, construction to last on the project? This will take two years to build. Okay. And 
you know, we spoke about um, the uh, 200 construction jobs that are going to be coming in uh, to this project. Look, I understand the financial constraints for uh, building affordable projects that are financed with HPD, but uh, can you commit here to uh, not uh, use subcontractors with a history of uh, multiple or open wage theft cases against them? Yes, definitely. Uh, this is a hard enough occupation and um, using subs with checkered pasts or always looking to cut corners is not something we want to do. So I think, as we said before, we will look into every option, every, every um, list that's out there, red flagging people. And if they're on that list, they'll be taken off our bid list. Great. Good to hear. Thank you. Um, all right. So regarding the 19,000 square feet of proposed commercial space, have you identified a tenant for this retail space yet? So we, we have an LOI from our partner slash um, tenant over on Frederick Douglass Boulevard, mm -hmm. um, who would love to put a, a supermarket in this area with where all these buildings are coming now as you know, so he has expressed interest. Um, we happen to have a lot of other um, tenancy in the Bronx. We have um, Brightside Daycares. We have a Fresenius Medical Center. We have an Urgent Care. We have um, a um, laundromat. So, and as I showed you on Alexander Avenue, we're, we're known to also get the smaller, more entrepreneurial type of tenants too. So I think based on our history and based on what's gonna be happening over there, we'll be able to fill those spaces it's quite early to really start doing it now, but we have reached out to our partners and they have given us an LOI for some of the space at least. Okay. And um, last question, you had mentioned the marketing strategy on this project uh, where you're going to partner up with uh, local stakeholders to hold uh, workshops on applying for um, Housing Connect um, and like their lottery process. Can you elaborate more uh, on community partners you anticipate to reach out to uh, to facilitate these workshops? And is this something that you've done uh, on other projects? Yes, so, so, so we, we will, one of our, um, we've asked Sobro to actually join us in the project as, um, as our not-for-profit that would um, you know, hold title to the property for us. Um, they would also um, <clears throat> help as Josh was saying with the, um, you know, the outreach on the MWBE, and then we would um, work with them on, uh, you know, reaching out through, they have a variety of, 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 of empowerment pro programs, you know, job training type programs that they work with and, 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 you know, ESL programs and stuff like that. So we would look to work with them to host a series of, of or, you know, a workshop or two to help people um, that might be interested in, in applying. And we could even look with, they, they also have a financial literacy program. So folks that, you know, need help also, um, like improving their credit scores and things like that, you know, we'd be looking to kind of work with them and, you know, help underwrite that in those programs as well. And then, um, like I said, I know in, um, in one of the other projects over on the east side that we're um, I'm not, you know, what looking to close in June, the Willow project um, that that we had pushed um, through the 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 the, um, uh, the HPD process. Uh, you know, I think um, in that case, uh, the council member Salamaka actually had um, HDC come in and kind of just do a, a global thing. So it's not necessarily just for us. Sometimes it's helpful just for everybody to learn the Housing Connect process. And again, HDC is willing to come. They can come to community board meetings. That's probably the more right form, um, but but we're more than happy to meet with anybody and try to coordinate with, with anything as possible, including Council Member Ayala and and if she had other not for profits um, to coordinate that too. Great, thank you. Um, that's it for me. Um, I now want to invite any of my colleagues uh, to ask questions. Um, if they um, have any questions, please um, raise the raise hand button. Oh, there we there we go. I see Council Member Ayala. Hi guys, sorry about that. It's okay. I'm, I have to hospital with my mom, so I'm like trying to get in and out, but I've been listening and I, I don't have any questions really. I think that I've grilled this team enough uh, during the, the numerous meetings that we've had, but I just wanted to reiterate my support, you know, 
for this project and that I'm really excited to finally be, you know, be developed. You know, I think it is both for, you know, the cultural life of that community and help from our community. So um, I just wanted to say thank you for that. Well, thank, thank you, you, Council Member Ayala, and uh, please, uh, we send uh, our best to that young lady. Okay. Yes. Wish for speedy recovery. Thank you, Council Member. Okay. Um, Council, do we have any other um, Council Members with questions? No, Chair, I see no other members with questions. Okay. There being no further questions, the applicant panel is now excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 261 Walton Avenue proposal? If there are any members of the public who do wish to testify on the 261 Walton Avenue proposal, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will briefly stand at ease while we uh, check to make sure there are no newly registered members of the public. Uh, Chair Moy, I see no members of the public who wish to testify uh, on 261 Walton Avenue. Okay, uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on LEU's numbers 781 and 782 for the 261 Walton Avenue proposal, the public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. I now uh, open the public hearing on LU numbers 785 and 786 for the 30-02 uh, Newtown Avenue rezoning proposal, which seeks a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment and relating to property in Queens. Uh, I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item, if you have not already done so, you must register online in advance and you may do that now by visiting the council's website. Uh, Council, if you can please call the first panel for this item. First panel for this item will include Frank St. Jacques, land use counsel for the applicant. Mr. St. Jacques, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Great, thank you. I've done so. Uh, Mr. St. Jacques, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth uh, in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have your presentation for this proposal, so when you're ready uh, for it to be shared, uh, please say so, and it will be displayed on screen by our staff. Uh, slides will be advanced when you say next. Please note that there may be a slight delay in both the initial loading and advancing of the slides. Once again, anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation may send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panel, uh, if the panelists would please restate uh, your name organization for the record, uh, you may begin. Thank you, Chair Moya and subcommittee members. Um, uh, please go ahead and, and share the presentation. Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Frank St. Jock with Ackerman LLP for the applicant. Uh, next slide, please. We are here to present an application for a zoning map amendment to change an existing C44A zoning district to a C44D zoning district and a zoning text amendment to establish the Mandatory Inclusionary Housing Program or MIH within the rezoning area. The purpose of the zoning map and text amendments is to facilitate the redevelopment of 3002 Newtown Avenue, located between 31st Street and 30th Street in Astoria, Queens in Community District 1. 
As shown on this area map, the surrounding area is a mix of residential, commercial, mixed residential, commercial, and community facility uses, as well as industrial use at the site. The built context is also varied with both lower and higher density, multifamily and commercial buildings surrounding the site. The area is very well served by public transportation, including the 30th Avenue NW subway station uh, just south of the site, as well as the Q18 and Q102 bus routes along 30th Avenue, uh, also a block south of the site. Just southwest of the site across 30th Street, you can see uh, the approximately one acre park at Athens Square. Next slide, please. The applicant is the Finkelstein family uh, who have run their family business um, uh, from the site at 3002 Newtown Avenue since 1919. The family is excited to have the opportunity to be part of a project that will benefit the Astoria neighborhood and the entire community. Next slide, please. The, uh, these photographs show the site's current conditions. Uh, due to the nature of the Finkelstein tire business, this corner is not particularly pedestrian friendly in contrast to the surrounding blocks that have more active ground floor local uses, often with residential use on upper floors. Next slide, please. The proposed rezoning is so shown on this zoning change map. Again, replacing the current C44A with a C44D district along Newtown Avenue between 31st Street and 30th Street. The 2010 Astoria rezoning mapped the current C44A district on portions of four blocks facing Newtown Avenue between 30th Street and 32nd Street. An inclusionary housing designated area was also mapped to encourage development of new market rate and affordable housing at this transit hub with an FAR bonus for providing inclusionary housing under the voluntary program. The City Planning Commission saw this as an area for growth with new development. However, over the past 10 years, no new buildings have been developed within the C44A that utilize the voluntary inclusionary housing program. Next slide, please. This chart shows housing units that have received a certificate of occupancy in Community District 1 since the 2010 Astoria rezoning. As you can see from the numbers on this chart, Community District 1 has seen significant levels of growth that had the fifth highest housing growth during that period of approximately 7,000 units. Next slide, please. In contrast, this HPD map shows sites in the inclusionary housing areas, designated areas that were established in the 2010 Astoria rezoning where income restricted housing units were produced with the voluntary program. Fewer than 50 of the more than 7,000 un total units uh, were inclusionary units. Next slide, please. The proposed rezoning would facilitate the development of an 11 story building with 104 apartments, including 26 permanently income restricted units and new ground floor commercial and community facility uses. For the commercial space, the applicant envisions local retail and services or food and beverage uses similar to the surrounding uses along 31st Street. The applicant is currently seeking a tenant for the community facility space. The proposed rezoning would activate and improve the streetscape on this corner and help stitch it into the surrounding blocks, as well as create new permanently income restricted housing at this transit oriented location. Next slide, please. This rendering shows the main design intent of the building is to focus the height at 31st Street, a wide street with elevated subway tracks, and then step down at the 30th Street frontage. You can also see the active uses on the ground floor which improved the pedestrian experience along the three street frontages the site uh, is on. Next slide, please. In this final slide, you can see the step down and building design on the 31st and 30th street frontages, as well as the active ground floor uses. This concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just one quick question. Uh, do you still plan to utilize uh, MIH option one here? Yes, uh, so with MIH option one, there would be 26 permanently uh, income restricted units at a weighted average of 60% AMI. Okay, great. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, council, do we have any council members that uh, have questions? No, Chair, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant is excused. Uh, councils are the uh, council. Is there any members of the public who wish to testify on the Newtown Avenue rezoning application? Yes, Chair Moya, we have a, uh, 
one public witness signed up to speak at this time. Uh, and as a reminder, um, anyone watching can view this meeting at the council's website. We will now hear from the first speaker, which will be Pierce Healy. Pierce Healy. Time starts now. Hey, good, mo good afternoon. My name is Pierce Hilly and I am a 32 BJ member. I am here on behalf of the 85,000 building service workers 32 BJ represents in New York City to express our support for this project. We are pleased that the developer for this project, MedRep Associates, has made a credible commitment to the prevailing wage for the future building service workers at the site. This new development will bring new good jobs and permanently affordable housing to Queens in a time we need them most. The percentage of affordable apartments are needed for working people in Queens. This affordable housing and commitment to good prevailing wage jobs will give opportunity for upward mobility, security, and dignity for, to working class families. We also applaud the steps the developer, the developer has taken to use the commercial space for a nonprofit cultural organization. 32BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build. We know that this development will continue to uphold the industry standard and provide opportunities for working families to thrive. On behalf of 32BJ SEIU, I respectfully urge you to approve this project. Thank you, thank you for your testimony today. Chair, that was the last speaker uh, on the panel. Okay. And I currently see no members with questions for the panel. Uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify um, on LU's 785, 786. All right, Chair. Uh, yep. With your permission, after you excuse this panel, I'll just make sure that no one else has signed up. Okay, sorry. Okay, there uh, being if, no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. And if there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on the 30-02 Newtown Avenue rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check for any members, any additional members of the public who may have registered. Okay, Jeremiah, I see no uh, other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, uh, thank you. There being no, uh, no members of the public who wish to testify on LU's number uh, 785-786 for the 30-02 Newtown Avenue rezoning proposal. The public hearing is now closed and the items are laid open. I now uh, will open the public hearing on LU numbers 783 for the 606 Neptune Avenue rezoning proposal, which seeks a zoning map amendment relating to property located in Brooklyn. For anyone wishing to testify on this item, if you have not already done so, you must register online in advance. And you may do that now by visiting the council's website. Uh, council, can you please call the first panel for this item? First panel for this item, the applicant panel for this item will include Neil Weisbard, Land Use Counsel for the applicant. Mr. Weisbard, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. Hi, I was just added. Good afternoon, Chair Moya, 
Council members, Neil Weisbart on behalf of McDonald's Corporation LLC. I sent a PowerPoint over I would like to use. Yeah. Excuse me, uh, Chair, with your permission, I'll swear in. Uh, yeah, Mr. Just, sorry uh, about that. Um, whenever you're ready, Council Mr. Weisbart, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm uh, to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all sub, uh, council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, whenever you're ready to share the presentation for this proposal, uh, please say so, and it will be displayed on the screen by our staff. Um, there may be a slight delay both in the loading and advancing of the slides. Um, so once again, um, anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation may send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would please uh, restate your name and organization for the record, you may begin. All right, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Moya. Neil Weisbard from Prior Cashman LLP on behalf of McDonald's. LLC, uh, LLC, and I would also like to share the presentation. Great, thank you. So we're here before you, we have filed an application with the New York City Department of City Planning and City Planning Commission to amend zoning map 28D which underlies 606 Neptune Avenue, Brooklyn. And the request is the, a change from a C1-2 commercial overlay to a C2-4 commercial overlay. Next, please. The change to the zoning map 28D will change the existing C1-2 commercial district, which is mapped within an R6 residence district 100 feet west of West 6th Street between Neptune Avenue and Sheepshead Bay Road to a C2-4 commercial district. The second part of this application is a modification of a restrictive declaration dated 1975 and amended in 1982 and 1986. The sole purpose of this amendment and modification is to legalize the drive-through facility, which is accessory to the McDonald's restaurant which has existed since 1982. Next, please. The site is located on the west side of West 6th Street between Sheepshead Bay Road and Neptune Avenue. The rezoning will extend 150 feet as the existing C12 commercial district already does. It will merely be changed to a C2-4. Next, please. In 1982, the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals granted a special permit, which drive through facilities typically seek in C1 districts pursuant to section 73243 of the zoning resolution. It was approved by the Board of Standards and Appeals for a term of five years. The term of the special permit was continuously renewed. There was a lapse here and there, but a new application was filed in 2014 and at such time, and, and one thing I failed to mention was that the site, it, the Special Ocean Parkway District underlies the site. And in 2015, the BSA informed McDonald's that since the site is located in the Special Ocean Parkway District, the drive-through special permit is not available. And therefore, the site plan that was attached to the restrictive declaration also needs to be modified to reflect existing conditions but the site needs to be rezoned to a C2-4, which is permitted without BSA approval. Next, please. The project area includes the entirety of the McDonald's site, a 35,700 square foot zoning lot, and will extend approximately 10 feet into the adjacent lot, which is occupied by St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church. This commercial district already extends into this such portion. So we're merely changing the C12 to a C2-4. Next, please. Here is just a picture of the proposed zoning map change. Next, please. Uh, there's no change in bulk under this proposed amendment. The only change is to permit 
a drive-through facility without having to seek border standards and appeals approval. There also are some other retail and service establishments that are permitted in the C2-4. However, the intent is to continue occupying the site with the McDonald's restaurant as it has been occupied since 1982. Next, please. This area just is well served by public transportation. There's three subway stops within close uh, proximity to the site and there's also numerous bus service. Next, please. This is a site plan of the site. As you can see, there's a large landscape area. There's 38 parking spaces and there will be no additional construction under this pro proposed zoning tax amend text amendment just to legalize the drive through Next, please. Here are just some elevation drawings of the McDonald's restaurant. And next, please. And this is just the layout of the restaurant where the drive through window is located. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, just a, a couple of questions here. Um, I know that the borough president approved this application with the recommendation that the manager of this McDonald's um, location engage com uh, Brooklyn Community Board 13. Um, how do you respond to this recommendation? We, uh, well, I work directly with McDonald's and McDonald's will reach out to the operator of the restaurant and relay that information. I don't know what else we could do other than that, but just to stay on top of it, I know that that operator primarily hires people from the local area and within Brooklyn. Okay, and the rezoning areas extends uh, 10 feet into the adjacent lot, which is controlled by the St. Paul's uh, uh, church. Uh, has there been any communication or outreach to the church uh, to make them aware of the proposal? Yes, a letter was sent, but we have not heard back. Okay. And as okay. I said, the, the C district already extended to that portion, just so that's clear. It currently exists in that portion. Okay. Well, that's all the questions um, that I have. Um, council, do we have any council members with um, any questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no uh, council members with questions. Okay. Um, there being uh, no further questions, uh, the applicant uh, uh, panel is excused. Uh, council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 606 Neptune Avenue rezoning application? If there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the 606 Neptune Avenue rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. The meeting will briefly stand at ease while we also check for any additional members of the public who may have uh, newly registered to testify. Chair Moya, I see no members of the public uh, who wish to testify on this item. Okay. Um, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on LU 783 for the 606 Neptune Avenue rezoning proposal, the public hearing is now closed and the item is laid over. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LU 784 for the 300 Huntington Street proposal, which seeks a zoning map amendment and which relates to property and council member Landers District in Brooklyn. Uh, I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. If you have not already done so, uh, you must register online in advance and you may do that now by visiting the council's website. Now, Council, are we going to uh, proceed 
or are we going to wait to read the um chair we can proceed now uh and once we have something for you we'll get that to you okay great thank you um so council if you could please call up the uh, first panel The applicant panel for this item includes Eric Vaff and Caroline Harris, land use counsel for the applicant. Also available for a question and answer on this item will be Thomas McMahon, Zachary Sansel Longmore, Will Tietch, and Jen Swatala. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. I believe I've accepted it. Do you hear me? Yes, Good. we do. Thank you. Uh, I'm Caroline Harris. I'm oh. uh, panelists. Please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm uh, that the testimony you will give today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer uh, honestly to all council member questions? Yes. Yes. Sorry, um, I just wanted to go through a couple of the procedural issues. We are in receipt of your proposal. Uh, when you are ready to present, please say so, and it will be displayed uh, on screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Uh, please note that there may be a slight delay in both the, lo the initial loading and the advancing of slides. And once again, anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation uh, may send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would uh, please restate your names and organizations for the record, uh, you may begin. I'm Caroline Harris, partner at Goldman Harris. We represent the applicant. Eric Bath, planning and development specialist, Goldman Harris, also for the applicant. Jen Swatala with Datner Architects, architect. Um, William TJ with uh, Scape Landscape Architecture. Zach Nelson Longmore with Manatoc Development, representing the owner. Should we proceed? Yes, whenever you're ready to begin, just let the sergeant Jump. veterans know. And, oh. uh, okay, we'd like to proceed with slide one, please. So uh, thank you very much uh, for holding this hearing by Zoom and for recognizing the importance of this project for economic development in Brooklyn. Um, we are seeking the city council's approval ultimately of a rezoning uh, from M21 to M23 on behalf of 300 Huntington Street LLC uh, for the property located at 300 Huntington Street. Uh, could you uh, move this slide forward, please? Uh, 300 Huntington Street LLC is an affiliate of Monadnock Construction one of the top builders of affordable housing in New York City, who currently employs about 250 people, 80 of them who work at their current headquarters in the Gowanus. In fact, uh, during COVID, they've been in construction of 14 affordable housing projects and um, the, the company is growing. They need more space. Uh, the principal, Nick Limbo, uh, who actually uh, worked and I think lived in the Gowanus area as a child, has been headquartered uh, with Manadnock in Brooklyn for 45 years, and he wants to keep his business and the jobs in the Gowanus area. Well, with their growth, they found that they need more, uh, a larger uh, premises, and looked in the neighborhood, found this property uh, which is zoned M21. Unfortunately, the parking requirements uh, in the M21 district make it infeasible to have both a construction yard and parking. Uh, after exploring many alternatives for uh, addressing this parking issue, uh, we with city planning landed on a rezoning to M23, 
which does not increase the floor area ratio or change the permitted uses. It simply has no parking requirements and is a perfect solution for this transit rich area next to the elevated subway near buses and bike paths. Um, this is a sustainable solution to Manad Knox dilemma as will its building uh, be a sustainable building. Uh, it'll be described by Ms. Switala uh, shortly. And the design of the waterfront public access, which was approved by city planning and is not technically before you, although we will be sharing it with you. We're excited that this sensitive design of the WPAA will be the Southern Gateway to the Gowanus uh, canals, the new WPAA that's proposed. And it will have flexibility in how it's used. It will be beautiful, have resilient landscaping, and above all, we'll be addressing stormwater management consistent with the goals for the site that were set forth in the Gowanus Lowlands Master Plan and the Gowanus Neighborhood Plan. I'd like to use the rest of this presentation to turn it over to my colleagues. First to Eric Vath, our Zoning and Development Specialist, who will review the zoning aspects with you. Then we will turn it on uh, consecutively to the different members of the team. And of course, we're available to answer questions of the committee. Thank you, Carrie, Mayor. Chair Moya. Uh, thank you, council members. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as Carrie mentioned, uh, Menanak has a, a long history uh, along the Gowanus in this area of Brooklyn. Uh, this map shows, if you look at the upper right-hand side, their current headquarters uh, located on 3rd Street. Uh, they have outgrown this, this site and wish to enlarge and, and construct the new building, which is uh, the subject rezoning before you. The development site is shown outlined in a dotted red boundary uh, that the rezoning site is located on the Gowanus next to the elevated FG line, uh, the Smith 9th Street station. Uh, the development site itself is actually indicated in yellow, you can see. Um, this area, the, the rezoned area and the development site are located in the Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Business Zone, the IBZ. It's actually right at the edge of the IBZ. On the other side of Huntington, indicated in a white dash dot line, is the proposed Gowanus neighborhood plan, the rezoning for Gowanus. Uh, so this site is adjacent and outside of the pro proposed Gowanus rezoning. Uh, and the IBZ is indicated in a light blue dashed line. So the IBZ generally extends to the south. Uh, this area is quite transit rich. You can see, of course, by the elevated FG train line. There's also the B57, B61 bus lines, uh, and there's a network of uh, pedestrian and, and bicycle paths that run through the neighborhood. Uh, as Carrie mentioned, the goal is to construct a, a, not only the building, the headquarters, but also a green and resilient waterfront public access area. Uh, it's a gateway to the Gowanus Waterfront Access Plan, which will be before you uh, in the coming months. Uh, and as such, this waterfront public access area will actually serve as one of the first sites to develop the waterfront, a beautiful esplanade uh, that opens up to the Gowanus. Uh, as Carrie mentioned, there are there's a waterfront certification and five authorizations which are not before you, but we will uh, share with you the specifics of, of, those, uh, of those plans. Now I would like to uh, just have the architect, Jen Swatala from Datner, just go over the building design uh, briefly. If you could go to the next slide. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so the building that we're proposing is a six story, roughly 100,000 gross square foot building, um, as they mentioned along uh, Huntington Street and the Gowanus Canal. Monotnock development will be um, occupying approximately a third of this building along with the contractor's yard um, with potential retail space and likely a restaurant that will occupy the ground floor. 
Monotonoc will also plan on leasing out the remaining space. Um, in addition to sort of some of the site strategies that Eric and Carrie already spoke about, um, specifically to the reduction in parking in this transit rich area, the building will also um, incorporate a high performing building envelope, high performing HVAC system, and then low flow plumbing fixtures. We'll also be designing a green roof on the primary six story roof and both site and street drainage. So the site drainage is part of our overall stormwater management plan um, that will not add to the uh, sort of already overburdened stormwater and um, CSO issues in Brooklyn. So we'll be draining directly out into the Gowanus Canal for all our stormwater. Um, and then street drainage as well is also being um, finalized with DEP and EPA. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Will, uh, next slide, who will speak to the stormwater or the storm, uh, stor sorry, shorefront public access. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Um, so uh, within, uh, and as, uh, as mentioned, um, the client has, um, you know, uh, it will be building the first and the southern sort of entrance and sort of gateway to the uh, the waterfront public access way. Um, the, the amenities included here uh, are everything from a, a shaded grove uh, with uh, a variety of seating options, both backless uh, and not movable um, to, to name a few. Uh, the waterfront access here will also be, uh, you know, lit meeting um, all, all the needs um, with that and will, uh, you know, serve both the, the public walkway, but also um, outdoor tenant area um, uh, for temporary use. Um, the design also has a lifted grove, um, as mentioned, uh, with a trellis arbor structure um, that resembles some of uh, the surrounding context of the Guanas Canal. Um, and then moving to the next slide, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about some of the stormwater runoff and the landscape design. Next slide. So along Huntington, um, you have a, a great uh, dropping down towards the canal itself. Um, this was an area identified um, as good uh, potential, um, you know, uh, ways to uh, help with stepping down the, the bulk wall here um, that provides a number of uh, planting strategies that help out with stormwater um, as well as water uh, uh, water clarity um, in, in terms of the Guanas Canal uh, with plants that you know absorb and also treat some of those uh, some of those issues found within the canal itself. Um, so uh, over to the left of the page here at the end of Huntington Streets, um, you can see where that that stepped terrace leads down to the canal itself. Next slide. Um, and then finally, as Jen was mentioning. Um, the site has also been, uh, you know, meets all the stormwater requirements, um, uh, you know, draining both the back of back of house of the, you know, uh, the, the development site itself, uh, draining through, uh, you know, the uh, public waterfront access area, also picking up drainage there before being um, discharged into the to the uh, Gowanus Canal. And um, I think Great. that's- Thank you, Will. Yep. Great. I appreciate it. Uh, if you could advance the next slide, we'll uh, talk briefly about the rezoning. Well, there's first, there's a, a beautiful rendering of the waterfront public access area. You can see the elevated uh, subway platform uh, off in the distance. Um, and it's worth noting the active uh, commercial that's proposed along the waterfront public access area. Uh, to the right there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are uh, authorizations, five authorizations uh, for the WPAA. Um, most of these are uh, technical issues, which actually put it into alignment with the proposed Gowanus Waterfront Access Plan, uh, the Gowanus WAP. Uh, they include an authorization to reduce the planting area uh, that allows some activation and some more flexible spaces for the community. 
there's a, a maximum grade change authorization, which as Will mentioned, that has to do with the title stepping along the bulkhead. Um, they've also waived uh, certain requirements for tree pits at the lifted grove to have a nice flush surface. Um, they've modified screening buffer requirements uh, to allow some connectivity between the lifted grove and those people that are coming down Huntington Street. And lastly, there's a maximum fence height uh, waiver authorization, which allowed the fence to uh, be the a height of, I believe, 42 inches uh, as required for guardrails. And then last slide. And then the technical rezoning, this is requested and this is before you today. Uh, the change from the M21 to the M23, as Carrie mentioned, does not change any of the bulk floor area height setback requirements. This is strictly a change uh, to eliminate parking requirements, which is a common concern of manufacturing and industrial sites is the high parking requirements. M23 is an appropriate district along the waterfront and is used elsewhere in the city for waterfront industrial sites. Uh, and as you can see on the proposed plan to the right, it involves the uh, block, the entire block, uh, including the development site. Uh, and I believe that concludes our presentation. Thank you for, um, for listening. Yeah, we leave you with a, a, a nice rendering from the subway platform. Thank you. Thank Any you questions? Thank you for your testimony. Um, a couple of questions here. Um, uh, what sustainability and resiliency measures are incorporated into the building's design and construction? We'll let uh, Jen address that. that. Um, as I mentioned, some of the sustainability items that are incorporated into the building um, are high performance windows. Um, a high performance building envelope, as well as low flow plumbing fixtures. Um, we'll also be incorporating the green roof um, on the spaces that we can up on the sixth floor um, roof to help with um, stormwater um, and site drainage. Okay, thank you. And um, how does your proposal meet the goals of the Gowanus Neighborhood Rezoning um, and IBIS framework? And how, would, how will you memorialize these commitments? This is not, this property is not part of the Gowanus rezoning. It's outside of the, the larger Gowanus rezoning that's being considered now. Uh, it, so it, it is not formally required to meet particular goals of that rezoning. Nevertheless, um, it is a manufacturing site and the client is uh, committed to having uh, a certain amount of uh, manufacturing uses in the building. First and foremost, Monadnock's own premises uh, will be uh, located in the building and committed to being remaining there. Um, we are working uh, with Council Member Lander's office to um, uh, establish a more formal uh, agreement. Uh, to guarantee that there would be light manufacturing and industrial component at the location. We expect that agreement to be concluded uh, shortly. Uh, we're also working with the SBIDC in that regard. Okay, um, that's it for me in terms of questions. Um, council, do we have any members, uh, other council members who may have questions? No, Chair, I see no other uh, members with questions. Okay, uh, but before we uh, dismiss the panel, I would just like to take the opportunity to read Council Member Lander's uh, statement uh, that he has uh, just sent over uh, for the record. So, uh, Minadna Construction has a long history in Gowanus and I'm thrilled that the company has decided to keep its headquarters in our community, 300 Huntington Street is within the Gowanus uh, IBIS and uh, its tenancy. This development will help strengthen our industrial uh, sector in Gowanus. Nonetheless, as we all know, industrial zoning allows office and other use uh, as of right, which garner more rent, often to the exclusion, uh, 
exclusion of the industrial businesses <clears throat> that we are trying to promote. I would, uh, I have worked hard with uh, Minadnock and the Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation over the past year to uh, reach an agreement that will permanently reserve a portion of this new building for the agreed upon list uh, of appropriate uses in exchange for the parking waiver that they are seeking. Uh, I am excited about this model and would like to see a similar approach taken throughout the I IBIS. Uh, we, we have made progress towards the agreement, but I um, have remaining questions to ensure that these developments meet our goals, including the following. And I apologize because the print is very, very small. <laughs> the font is very small on my phone, so I'm struggling uh, to look at it here. Um, so these are the questions that uh, the councilman has uh, proposed. Uh, do you agree to a contract that imposes permanent use restrictions on 10,000 square feet of floor area in the new development in uh, except in the case that a rezoning alters the use of the site itself. Um, and that is without any provision for termination based on zoning changes off site. Also, will you guarantee to provide 5,000 square feet of space to be leased with the SBIDC at the agreed upon reduced rate for at least 16 years? Uh, will you commit to provide periodic reporting of occupancy to uh, SBIDC? I greatly appreciate the partnership of SBDIC and uh, the Corporation of uh, Minadnock in working towards an agreement that I am hopeful that we will achieve uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you. We uh, uh, appreciate the council members' support and, and are working towards addressing all of the issues he raised. Um, which we will be doing. We're making progress. Um, and I, I failed to point out that the community board and the borough presidents have support, support this project. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 300 Huntington Street application? If there are any members of the public who wish to testify on the 300 Huntington Street proposal, please press the raise hand button now. And Chair, the meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check for any additional members of the public who may have registered to testify. Chair Moya, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Thank you. Uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on LU 784 for the 300 Huntington Street proposal, the public hearing is now closed and the item is laid over. I now open the public hearing on LU numbers 777 and 778 for the Arthur Avenue Hotel rezoning proposal, which seeks a zoning map amendment and a zoning text amendment, uh, and which relates to property in council member Felice's district in the Bronx. Uh, I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to uh, testify on this item. If you have not already done so, you must register online in advance and you may do so now by visiting the council's website. Uh, I now wanna take this opportunity uh, to welcome uh, our uh, newly elected uh, council member, uh, council member uh, Felice. Uh, thank you for joining us here today. I'll turn it over to you for some remarks. Thank you, Chair Moya. Thank you for recognizing me and also for allowing me to come here today to speak about uh, the Arthur Avenue Hotel proposal located in the Belmont Little Italy section in the 15th council district. Uh, in brief, this project consists of a zoning map amendment to rezone the project area from R6 and R6 C24 zoning districts to a C61 zoning district, and also to map 
a C1 for commercial overlay in an existing R6 district. Additionally, the applicant team is requesting a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option two and four, AKA the workforce housing option. Uh, these two applications, if approved by the city council, would facilitate the development of a new mixed use development comprised of a 13 story hotel with approximately 146 hotel rooms and also 128 parking spaces. In addition to that, a seven story residential development containing 56 dwelling units, 17 which would be permanently affordable and also 28 accessory parking spaces. Uh, through the Euler process, these applications found support from many members of the Bronx, including Community Board 6, who voted to approve the project, as well as the Bronx Borough President, who also recommended approval of the project. I've also spoke, spoke with many community leaders, uh, business owners, uh, who have also stated they're very supportive of the proposal. Uh, last night, I spoke with the local bid director, Kira Madonia. Uh, who, who said the hotel will not only allow visitors from outside of New York City uh, to come to New York City and the Bronx, but it'll also allow them to stay in areas of Arthur Avenue and the location. Um, we have the Bronx Zoo just mi minutes away, uh, the Botanical Garden as well. Um, and the more people can stay in the neighborhood, the more business can be done in the neighborhood. And the more economic activity in the, in the area, the more people in the area that can be employed. Uh, however, I do have a few questions and concerns about affordability with the proposed project. Uh, specifically, the median rent in the area is below the affordability levels proposed in this development. And I'm looking very forward to a discussion on that topic. Um, and I'm also looking very forward to hearing about the proposed uh, jobs uh, that the project will um, create, including construction jobs, but also jobs after the project is uh, fully built. On that note, I would like to uh, thank the applicant team for coming today uh, to discuss the project. Uh, and I'm looking very forward to hearing more about the proposal and also uh, hearing from members of the public about uh, questions and any concerns that you may have. Uh, thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, council, if you could please um, call up uh, the first panel for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Harry Bajraktari and Naeem Bajraktari uh, for the owner applicant, Nora Martins, land use counsel for the applicant, and Sandra Erickson. Panelists, if you have not already done so, please accept the unmute request in order to begin to speak. And if uh, the panelists would please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee in an answer to all council member questions? I do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when you are uh, ready to share the slideshow presentation, please say so, and it will be displayed on the screen for our staff. Uh, anyone requesting an accessible version of this presentation is reminded to please do so by email, uh, by email uh, and request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now if the panelists would please uh, restate your uh, names, organizations for the record, uh, you may begin. Eric Barakari, uh, the owner and developer. Naya Barakari, uh, his attorney and son. Nora Martins, Ackerman LLP Land Use Council for the applicant. You may begin whenever you're ready. Great. So, uh, good afternoon now, Chair Moya um, and Council Member Feliz and other Council Members. Um, just before I jump into the presentation, I think Harry would like to just say a few words to address the committee um, about this project that has been his dream and his vision um, on Arthur Avenue. Chairman Moya, Councilman Felice, members of the subcommittee, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to present you the hotel on Arthur Avenue project. 
This hotel will become a destination for visitors around our state and our country. We're excited about the hotel's location, Bronx, Little Italy, which is an area known for its restaurants, delis, uh, food markets, uh, bakeries, and butcher shops, fish stores. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, neighborhood. Walking distance to the Bronx Zoo, Botanical Garden, Fordham University, and a short ride to Yankee Stadium. I have worked in the Bronx for over 40 years. For me and my family, Bronx has been wonderful. I am excited about this project. I would love to see this project built. Uh, we invest, uh, again, you know, we're over 40 years in the Bronx. My children are here, my son and my daughter. I'm trying to encourage my family to be part of the Bronx, to, to follow in the footsteps of Madonia Bakery, Madonia family, uh, titled brothers. They've been over 105 years. Madonia Bakery and Madonia family have been there over 100 years. I have been in a neighborhood over 30 years. This is a very passionate, excited project. We've put a lot of effort and a lot of energy. And I thank you for making this project a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harry. Okay, if um, you kindly share the presentation, we'll get started. So as um, was introduced uh, so well by Councilmember Feliz, uh, this project seeks to establish um, really a first of its kind hotel uh, in the heart of Little Italy in the Bronx, the Belmont neighborhood on Arthur Avenue. Uh, also seeks to build in conjunction with the hotel and to help finance the feasibility of the hotel, a smaller residential development. Next slide. In order to facilitate um, the development of the hotel and, and residential building, we seek the following two actions. Uh, seek approval from the council, including a, a zoning map amendment, which would rezone the development site, uh, which consists of several tax lots that have been assembled over the years, um, fronting on uh, Arthur Avenue and Hughes Avenue in East 188th Street from a R6 zoning district. Um, to a C6-1 zoning district, which permits the hotel use and also the density necessary um, to develop this project. In connection with the zoning map amendment, proposing a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area, which would establish both option two and a workforce option. Option two requires 30% of the residential floor be set aside to households making an average of 80% of the area median income and the workforce option uh, also requires a 30% set aside, does not allow subsidy, and allows for an average um, household with an average of 115% of the area median income, although 5% of that floor must be at no higher than 70%, and 5%, a minimum of 5% must be no higher than 90% of the area median income. Next slide. The zoning change map illustrating the proposed rezoning area, you can see on the left the existing zoning and on the right outlined uh, with the dotted line is the development site, which will be rezoned to C61. Uh, the rezoning, as part of this rezoning application, uh, also seeking to rezone a small portion of the block to the south, just south of Chicharron Park, which um, it's a site currently occupied by Tino's Delicatessen, which has been in the neighborhood for decades, just like every business in this neighborhood. Um, they Unfortunately, don't have a full commercial overlay covering their site, which is an unusual condition along Arthur Avenue. So as part of this rezoning application, we're just extending that commercial overlay all the way to the southernmost boundary of the park um, so that they're fully included in the commercial overlay. Next slide. You can see here, just the site location. Again, um, you can see really in the heart of Belmont, and almost heart-shaped actually, neighborhood. Um, and right at the entrance of the Arthur Avenue Little Italy neighborhood between Fordham Road and East 188th Street. 
this hotel will really serve as a beacon here in the neighborhood. Next slide. Just some photos showing the existing conditions at the development site um, occupied by a variety of um, small commercial uses and residential buildings. The, you know, uh, as Harry mentioned, he's been in this neighborhood a long time and is very sensitive to all of, you know, any concerns about displacement um, and keeping business in the neighborhood. The funeral home uh, will, everyone's aware of this plan and the funeral home will relocate to another um, location that they have in the neighborhood on East 180th, 84th Street. Um, Baraktari Realty, which is one of the users here, will also relocate. They have other property on Hoffman. And then there are 21 residential units within the rezoning area. None of these are rent stabilized. They're, I think, almost exclusively used for student housing and have been mostly vacant over the past year. So there will be no displacement there. There are two other small commercial tenants, a nail salon and, I'm sorry, a hair salon and insurance businesses. Um, they're on month to month leases and uh, our actuary realty will make sure to give ample notice and, and relocation assistance um, once this project is ready to commence construction. Next slide. I think just this quick slide showing um, what was discussed previously about just all of the institutions and destinations that surround the proposed hotel site and, and including Ford University, the Botanical Gardens, the Brock Zoo, um, and then medical institutions in Montefiore and St. Barnabas Hospital. Uh, and received letters and testimony and support. Uh, hopefully you'll hear from some of them today, um, all wholeheartedly endorsing this project. Next slide. And again, I think yeah, all, probably everyone in the city council, even those not from the Bronx, are aware of all the you know, exciting offerings on Arthur Avenue. Um, but I think especially after this really challenging year for you know, a neighborhood that really relies on small business and retail and restaurant use, um, this project is even more exciting. Next slide. Just some comparative hotel data. Um, showing how underserved the Bronx is with regard to hotels. Um, in New York City, there are approximately 906 hotels, only 64 of which are in the Bronx, um, and only 10 within a mile of the development site. Next slide. And of those 10 um, properties that are identified as hotels in, in public property records, only three are actually really operating as hotels with hotel services. Um, many of them are operated as homeless shelters or um, are not, not operating as hotels. And in fact, actually the closest hotel, the Bronx Park Motel, which you'll see if you ever visit Botanical Gardens or the zoo or Fordham is uh, recently listed for sale as a redevelopment site. So there's a desperate need for this hotel use in the neighborhood. Next slide. Just some details about the proposed development. As mentioned, it would be two buildings, a hotel building and a residential building. Total of 122,694 square feet of floor area, uh, which maximizes the 6.0 FAR permitted in the proposed C61 zoning district. Um, and while we've maximized the floor area, we, with the help of city planning, have masked the development to, to be more appropriate uh, in the context of the neighborhood. The hotel is 13 stories and that fronts on Arthur Avenue and East 188th Street. And the residential building is on Hughes Avenue. It's only seven stories, which is more contextual with the residential nature along Hughes Avenue. The hotel is proposed to have approximately 146 hotel rooms, some active ground floor uses along Arthur Avenue and East 188th Street, um, some outdoor amenity space, and also 128 accessory parking spaces. The residential building will contain relatively small, approximately 56 dwelling units, 17 of which are proposed to be permanently affordable uh, pursuant to the workforce option of mandatory inclusion of housing. And then 28 accessory parking spaces are allocated to the residential development. Next slide. Just a site plan that shows the, you know, the location of the hotel, which is on the left on Arthur Avenue and East 188th Street, and then the residential building on Hughes and 
East 28th Street. The hotel, while it is 13 stories, um, it goes up to seven stories to 75 feet before setting back significantly uh, to preserve the, the streetscape and the pedestrian experience of the building as, as not a 13 story tower. Next slide. So you can see on the ground floor plan, the entrance to the parking. Um, parking and loading was proposed on Arthur Avenue. There's an existing curb cut there that would just be widened to serve this development. So as not to uh, interrupt the pedestrian experience too much on Arthur Avenue, that curb cut would serve the um, proposed parking, which would be located on, at, on the ground level and also uh, at a cellar level. And it would be fully attended accessory um, parking. Next slide. And that's just illustrating uh, the remainder of the parking. Next slide. Here you have renderings of the proposed hotel and the proposed residential building. And um, the next slide. I think I'll turn it over now to Nayim Bharaktari to discuss um, the unit distribution and the proposed rents under the workforce housing option. Uh, I just will note that with regard to unit distribution, this building is intended to be um, for working families. Um, and with that in mind, it was designed with a significant percentage of two and three bedrooms, um, nearly 50%, 46% are two and three bedroom units uh, to accommodate this family. Next slide. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, as you can see from the slide here, we looked at the workforce housing option and the rents here are comparable to what's in the market, which is between student housing and then the rent stabilized that's also there. Uh, we tried to look at what would fit in the neighborhood based on the people who work in the neighborhood so that they can they don't only work, they can hopefully stay in the neighborhood as well. Uh, we always get the question from waiters who work, they, they can't find any place that works, nothing that's affordable for them. Uh, Lower AMIs, wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to qualify, so they wouldn't be able to work and live in the area. So when we looked at it, we have a six unit distribution for the 70% AMI, one studio at a rent of about 1300, that lower income limit, which will get to two workers, two retail workers, uh, the two one bedrooms, two two bedrooms, and one three bedroom, so we get a working family in there as well. Again, six units at the 90% AMI with the same split of one studio, one, two, uh, one bedrooms, two two bedrooms and one three bedroom. We were looking at the nurses. We've seen them in the past on the on Arthur Avenue and speaking to them. They can't find a place that's affordable for them either. A lot of these people end up moving into lower Westchester or other parts of the Bronx uh, where they can find it uh, and it's a little too far. So we want to try to keep them in the neighborhood. And then at the 130% AMI, it's five units, three one bedrooms and two two bedrooms. We were looking at this from the point of uh, a hotel union worker, if they're a union or even a quarter making it $33 an hour, they would still be able to qualify for 130 at the higher AMI here. So they wouldn't be priced out and have to move somewhere else. And uh, that was our goal with this to try to make sure that people can work and stay in the, the neighborhood. Uh, next slide. Again, uh, the operation of the, again, the economic impact is from everybody in the Arthur Avenue is a lot of economic activity will come from this hotel. We're hoping that more customers will increase sales tax and hopefully people stay even longer. Uh, a lot of partners between the hotels and local businesses. We've had discussions before about that it would open up a whole new revenue business of breakfast and brunch, which is not happening right now on Arthur Avenue, which would be nice. I've heard from the merchants. Uh, new employment, we have 231 direct construction jobs, 127 indirect, 58 permanent jobs. So that's, we're looking for that. That's just for start off with. The new housing, we're in desperate need of new housing in this area over here. A lot of it is very old and it doesn't fit families. People end up having to move out because they can't, there's no more room for a second kid or a third kid. Uh, and again, by making 17 of them afford, permanently affordable, they can work and still stay in the area as opposed to they would price themselves out by working. So this is what we're looking for. Next slide. Questions? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, and, and Harry, had I known you had a fully stocked bar, uh, I would have held my uh, committee hearing from there. Anytime, anytime. <laughs> you should have given us a heads up. 
definitely. <laughs> uh, look, I just want to go into this before I hand it over to uh, Council Member uh, Felice. Uh, will the residents in the 56 units uh, be able to access the use of the hotel portion of the uh, project's outdoor amenity space? We, we want to work with that with depending on the operator. We want to see how to make that work uh, with the operator's goals and what they're doing on there. So we're leaving that still open. We hope that we can find some way to provide them access, especially, uh, I mean, there will be a rooftop lounge we're hoping for there. So uh, we're hoping to see how to make that all work for everybody. And we'd like to talk with the operator at the same time for the residential side, what we can do with that rooftop space as well to provide another public space for the people living there. But it's a matter of dollars and cents and what can work without uh, creating a hazard. Okay, thank you. Uh, you, you've mentioned uh, uh, the, the opportunity for the hotel project to establish uh, partnerships with local businesses. Uh, what considerations uh, on this have been made? And can you elaborate on any opportunities you've uh, identified uh, already? Uh, one of the things that we made sure to do is uh, we, we like the idea of a, a higher star hotel that requires a certain class restaurant. We don't want to have a restaurant at this facility. We don't want to compete with the neighborhood. There's, a plethora of restaurants that do a very good job. So we really want to have a catering facility. We have an idea of trying to partner with the church, the newly restored church, Our Lady of Mount Mark Carmel, which is beautiful now. Hopefully people can have weddings and have the receptions over at the hotel, uh, which can't be accommodated by the, the restaurants. And then at the same time too, there will be some storefront, uh, hopefully some smaller cafes on the 188th street side there. We're hoping to make sure that it's not a, a Starbucks, something else. We're hoping to see if we can get somebody locally to open up and be there in the spot. Uh, there's also some other opportunities, but it depends on how we talk with the operator. The idea of trying to have a concierge service where you come down, stay for the weekend, you can go to the zoo, but somebody can go pick up your bread, your raviolis and your meat and have that ready for you when you're ready to leave. We really like that idea of uh, being able to provide that. Uh, and I know I've heard that from a lot of people. They'd love to come down and experience everything in the Bronx, and then leave with a ravioli, which has been the big thing. <laughs> now I'm hungry and thirsty. Uh, and uh, my, my last question is, uh, has uh, a general contractor been selected uh, for this project? No, we're gonna be working with that when we get to, we're trying to find the right operator and then the right contractor to make sure that everything is set up over there. Unfortunately, reality is we're dealing with that most of the operators we lose to Southern Westchester where they don't, they see it, they see these are the same product. They look at the Bronx as riskier. We've had a hard time showing them otherwise, but there have been people even through the pandemic reaching back out that we've talked to and they're very interested to see what's going on. So we want to find that right partnership of who's going to do right by the neighborhood. It's kind of a Goldilocks paradox. It has to be just right. Otherwise he doesn't, he's not gonna let me do it. <laughs> All right, um, but can you speak to the efforts that will be made though in terms of local hiring for construction it's, uh, and, and similarly like uh, what efforts will be made in terms of the MWB e participation for the construction project well also that's going to be and again we're going to combine what we're talking with the operators and developers to talk from there but from Harry's perspective and this is what it's going to be is that if it's not going to be the right fit you're, you're going to not use Bronx workers you're not going to buy locally you're not going to do this over there you'd rather find somebody else that does it and we're willing to wait to find the right partner to make it happen the way that he wants it to. He says all the time, he goes, I'm not trying to build a hotel in the Bronx. I'm trying to build a Bronx hotel. It has to have that character, which means it has to be involved. And, and I'm excited because we've been in the Bronx such a long time that we want this hotel to be part of the community, be part of the neighborhood. I'm over, over 40 years in, in the Bronx. We had opportunities to sell this land and we did not sell the land because we wanted to see this project take root here. And I'm excited about it. Yeah, and I'll just add with um, regard to the MWBE participation, um, a hotel project would likely seek tax benefits under the ICAP program, which does uh, require solicitation of bids from MWBEs as a, as a detailed program. Um, well, that's it for me. Thank you so much um, for your testimony today. I want to hand it over now to Council Member uh, Felice uh, for uh, his questions. Thank you so much, Chair Moya. I thank you all for the presentation on this uh, topic. Very uh, informative and thorough. 
A uh, few questions. Uh, so you have intentions of mapping MIA option one and two as part of this application. These options do not offer the same level of affordability as other options, including uh, option number one. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, your decision to select these MIA options for the project? Sure, uh, I'll, I'll speak on that. That's our, our biggest concern has been that uh, because of the higher market rents that's off of there, we're trying to provide affordability at the lower AMIs. A lot of people who work in there, almost everybody who works in the neighborhood couldn't afford to any of these units that's off of there. And we, we see the nurses constantly at the, when we go out to eat, we see them uh, not as much now when everybody's so distant, but even the people working in the neighborhood, because we're in real estate, we're constantly being asked, do you know anybody who has an apartment? Do you have, and they don't, it's too expensive. It's too, you know, they end up moving further in the Bronx or into Southern Westchester and then commuting. And so we were looking at it with these affordabilities, looking at those people trying to service them. You know, we're looking at school teachers that if they make, if they start a $60,000 salary, they can run into a problem where they can't afford to live in this, afford in this area here. And that'd be a problem for us. So we're really looking to make sure that the people who work in the Bronx can stay in the Bronx. Thank you. And another question uh, is on regarding the unit distribution. Uh, the unit distribution might not align with our hope. Uh, one hope that we all have is that the units be filled with working families. Um, has there been any consideration to alter the unit distribution to include more three bedroom apartments and fewer, fewer uh, studios and one bedroom apartments? We, we have looked at it. Uh, this was the preliminary. This is what we felt the market. This is what people are looking for the most of. Three bedrooms, we have talked about doing more. It's just that they're, they're a little bit harder to rent sometimes. There's not as much demand in the area for it. The two bedrooms seem to be the, the key point as far as a price point and space for everybody else with it. We felt bad to take out the studios because then it makes it seem uh, as much as we want to help the working family, there are some single people who are working and just starting out. They want to be able to rent, stay in the area in the studios and then not have to leave automatically be somewhere else. The idea of the studios is that you, you don't have to leave. So you can, you can still be there if you don't want to get married and have kids. So it may mix the, the one number that we have gone back and forth on. We'd like to see whether or not on the apartment layouts, if there's a way that we can get slightly more two bedrooms because we feel that's the, the maximum number for working family that's also there. We're looking at one kid and a baby and then two kids sharing a room. But uh, it's going to how we we organize the common space when we talk about that with the operator and the developer on there to see how to do that. But we have a preference for those two bedrooms, which rents very easily as opposed to a three bedroom. Right, and I'll note that uh, unfortunately in a lot of projects you see very few, sometimes often zero three bedroom units. Um, so here I think, I know the, the Bronx Borough President, um, they're always seeking a minimum of 40%. And um, you know we're here with 46%, um, we lose 50 and and as Naim said, we're going to see if we can, you know, within the relatively constrained footprint of the residential building, include a few more two bedrooms, understanding that concern. Okay. And final question. Uh, the 2019 median rent in the area, the area that the project is being proposed, median rent for 2019 was $1,290. Um, that means the proposed affordability at MIA option four would be higher than the median. Uh, can you discuss this and also explain the logic of, you know, mapping the workforce housing in this development? Sure. sure I'm not sure. Um, is that the median for the, the congressional district or for the community district? I just am not familiar with that statistic. We can look into that, of course. We can look into that, yeah. I'm okay, sure. But I think just response is that, you know, that median area is greater. I think right here on Arthur Avenue in this, in the Belmont neighborhood, you have sort of a unique condition with regard to the market. Um, you know, just from uh, Harry and Nime's experience um, in the neighborhood, I mean, rents range uh, for a two bedroom from you know, 1900 to 3600 for units. So the market is higher here likely because of university and the institutions in the neighborhood, but the housing stock is quite old and there's not much new housing being built. So given the quality of this new construction and what it will offer um, for families and professionals to stay in the neighborhood and really contribute to that 
income diversity that helps a local economy. It seemed that this does make sense in this specific neighborhood. Okay. Uh, thank you. No more questions for me on my end. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you, Council Member. Thank you for your questions. Um, council, uh, do we have any other council members that have questions for this panel? Uh, no, Chair, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay. Um, one second. Okay. Uh, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant uh, panel is excused. And now, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the Arthur Avenue Hotel uh, rezoning application? Yes, Chair Moya, we have uh, five public witnesses who have signed up to speak. For members of the public here to testify, please stand by and prepare to speak uh, when the Chair says that you may begin. Please also note that once your group has completed their testimony, you will be removed from the meeting as a group. Uh, and once removed, you may continue to view the live stream broadcast of this meeting uh, at the council website. We will now hear from the first panel, which will include Monica Paciulo, William Colonna, John Calvelli, Aaron Busca, and Alyssa Tucker. The first speaker will be Monica Paciulo, followed by William Colonna. Time starts now. Just one quick uh, procedural note. Uh, I just wanna remind uh, members of the public that you will be given uh, two minutes to speak. Uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms uh, has started the clock. Time starts now. Am I first? Because my computer glitched out a little. Monica, you're first. Monica, okay. Hi, my name is Monica Pachulo, and I am very excited to be here speaking today on behalf of Tino's Delicatessen to express our support for the proposed Arthur Avenue Hotel rezoning application. Tino's is our family business, and it's been part of the community, Belmont community for over 50 years. My parents have owned it for 25, but they've been in the neighborhood with other businesses for about 40, maybe more. Property is located at 2410 Arthur Avenue, which is within the proposed rezoning area. If approved, the proposed rezoning would extend an existing commercial overlay north to include our entire property. We understand that the proposed rezoning would also facilitate the development of two new buildings, including a 13 a story hotel on Arthur Avenue and a seven story apartment building on Hughes Avenue. I don't, I don't need to tell you that it has been an incredibly challenging year for the restaurant business and for Arthur Avenue. The rezoning will not only benefit Tino's directly, but the proposal hotel will strengthen all of Arthur Avenue and inject new life into the local economy for decades to come. A hotel will create new employment opportunities in our Belmont uh, neighborhood and open the door for partnership with local businesses such as ours. Meanwhile, the proposed apartment buildings will increase the customer base for area stores and restaurants. For these reasons, I urge you to approve the proposed Arthur Avenue Hotel rezoning. Thank you. I also speak to a lot of um, uh, like tourists that come from France and stuff, and they always want to stay in the neighborhood and there's no place to stay. So. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today, Monica. Thank you. Next speaker will be William Colonna, followed by John Calvelli. Time starts now. Hold on, Bill. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Bill Colonna and I'm Fordham University's Director of Government Relations, Federal and Urban Affairs. And on behalf of Fordham, we are in support of the Arthur Avenue Hotel and Residences Development Project. The Bronx's history, cultural offerings, world-class events, and educational institutions are only some of the reasons 
that make our borough a tourism destination in New York City. Throughout the year, Fordham hosts several events that welcome many visitors to our Rose Hill campus. Move-in and orientation, athletic competitions, conferences and other special events, campus tours for prospective students, and commencement. Many of these events bring hundreds of visitors to the Northwest Bronx who sometimes travel outside of the city for accommodation. The Arthur Avenue Hotel and Residences Development Project, once completed, will provide a more convenient option for our visitors. Accommodations that are walking distance from our campus, opening up the opportunity for them to experience other attractions in our neighborhood, such as exhibits at the Bronx Zoo and New York Botanical Garden, restaurants in Little Italy, and shopping along Forum Road. And this project will also bring additional affordable housing options to our community. We strongly urge the council to give the Arthur Avenue Hotel and Residences Development Project serious consideration as it undergoes the uniform land use review procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for your testimony today. Next, we'll hear from John Calvelli, followed by Aaron Busca. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is John Calvelli. I'm the Executive Vice President for the Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, which is headquartered at the Bronx Zoo. I felt a, a little um, like the young, young kid on the block when we were talking about Madonia, et cetera. We've only been in the neighborhood 122 years. So therefore, I wanted to just echo the words of, of Harry Baraktari, an actual council member for lease. Thank you very much for all that you've done to help move this project forward in your short time that you've been in the council. The long and the short of it is for us, this is an incredible opportunity for the Bronx Zoo, for the New York Botanical Garden, for Fordham University, for everyone in the neighborhood to have a beautiful hotel that will allow us to partner. And Chair Moy, you spoke about partnership opportunities. This is gonna be an incredible marketing and partnership opportunity for us to expand the, uh, the areas where people will be able to come and stay in the neighborhood, but also come to the Bronx Zoo or go to the garden or attend an event at Fordham University. So I just wanted to quickly uh, add my voice and add the voice of the Bronx Zoo and the Wildlife Conservation Society to this effort. Uh, and I really wanted to commend the Baraktari family for having that vision. I was born on 180th and Hughes, went to Fordham University and now work at, uh, at the Bronx Zoo. So I haven't gone very far in life, but I've been able to see the world thanks to these great institutions and this great neighborhood. And we just look forward to having this hotel open and more importantly, also the residential housing that will be available as well for the community. It'll strengthen all of us. Thank you very much. John. Next, we'll hear from Aaron Busca, followed by Alyssa Tucker. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Moya, and congratulations, Councilman uh, Feliz. Look forward to working with you. My name is Aaron Boschka. I'm speaking on behalf of the New York Botanical Garden, a 250-acre urban oasis, just a few hundred yards from the beginning of Arthur Avenue. Uh, I'm offering my uh, unconditioned support for this uh, Euler uh, process. Uh, NYBG is now celebrating our 130th anniversary as an anchor institution. We're a major employer of Bronx residents, an educator of youth and adults, a tourist in engine and a worldwide scientific research institution. But our home is always and has been and always will be this corner of the Bronx. As we kick off AAPI month, NYBG is proud to host Yayoi Kusama's Cosmic Nature Exhibition, which is already filling seats of our neighborhood businesses. And we share uh, the neighborhood with our remarkable neighbors who you already met. It's our understanding that this new project would bo bring both a uh, hotel and a residential building. And I'd just like to note that NYBG employees really need workforce housing in our neighborhood that is affordable to the MTA worker the public school teacher, the police officer, the DC 37 horticulture staff, or zookeeper and their families. So I think the workforce uh, housing element is particularly important for our neighborhood. As one of these neighborhood institutions, we encourage this committee and city council to join the course of support in the proposed rezoning. A project such as this one would only enhance this unique ecosystem in the Bronx while aiding our residential neighbors and small businesses with additional uh, economic activity. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. The last speaker on the panel will be Alyssa Tucker. Time starts now. On behalf of the Belmont Business Improvement District, I, Alyssa Tucker, Executive Director, express our support for this rezoning and project. 
Our community is lined with a plethora of small family owned businesses comprising of gourmet food shops, restaurants, business services, and more. Our data has shown that the neighborhood hosts thousands of regional and local shoppers, as well as domestic and international tourists every year. Yet there are extremely limited hotel options in our neighborhood and a lack of quality full service hotels throughout Bronx Community Board 6. We are thrilled to see that a hotel is finally being proposed on Arthur Avenue, and we believe that the development will have a positive effect on local economic development by supporting neighborhood businesses and generating new jobs. The proposed development will also provide new housing in this community, and we believe the proposed workforce housing option is appropriate as it is affordable to families with moderate to middle incomes. There are also permanently affordable units included, which are appealing to the community as well. Our data has shown that 85% of visitors come from over five miles away and they drive here, making additional parking a crucial need for the neighborhood. The addition of 156 parking spaces between the two developments is another benefit of the project. Having a hotel within easy walking distance of our restaurants and businesses, a hotel that is actually in the heart of the neighborhood is ideal. Arthur Avenue is the perfect place for a hotel, given it is the main thoroughfare of the community and its close proximity to several cultural attractions and institutions, including the Bronx Zoo, the New York Botanical Garden, Fordham University, and the SBH Health System. With the development of this hotel, guests would be able to extend their stay and visit more of the great destinations the Bronx has to offer. Therefore, the Belmont bid fully supports the proposed Arthur Avenue Hotel project and rezoning. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, council, do we have any council members that have any questions for this panel? No chair, I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay. Uh, there being no uh, questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Uh, Council, can you please call up uh, the next panel? If there are any other uh, members of the public who wish to testify on the Arthur Avenue Hotel rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. Chair, the meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check for any additional members of the public who may have registered to testify. Chair Moy, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Thank you. Uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on LU's numbers 777 and 778 for the Arthur Avenue Hotel rezoning proposal, the public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. Uh, that concludes today's business. Uh, I will remind the viewing public uh, for anyone wishing to submit written testimony for items that were heard today, please send it by email to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. I would like to take the opportunity now to thank uh, the members of the public, my colleagues, the subcommittee council, of course, uh, land use and other council staff and the sergeant at arms for participating in today's meeting. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>